Hello everybody, Ethan McKinley here again with the lovely Alex. Look at the, there you go, look, Alex. Uh, we have a lovely guest in today, someone I've actually heard of. Yes, he's looking around, it's you, Tim. Oh. Uh, Tim Dry is with us. Now, what, you've been a, uh, you started, <coughs> I guess, the, one of the, you're part of the new romantic movement in a sense. Uh, uh, you well, you started mime and physical theatre with Tick and Tock. Yeah. Not only satisfied with that, he turned into an actor. Yeah. Bastard, I already hate him. He was in Star Wars. Yeah. And probably the highest acolyte an actor can get. You've had, not an Oscar, but a, a an action, action figure. figure made out of you. Isn't that the coolest thing I hate ever? him already, I'm only kidding. Good, good. That's Trading cards, up. his lovely biography, which I didn't read because it didn't come in time. Sorry, Tim, but nice. we'll get to that. Uh, like a man who does falling his research. Upwards. And, uh, <laughs> Would you like to know why I called it Falling Upwards? Yes. Okay. I was having a philosophical conversation one day with a friend. And he <laughs> told me that uh, when fish die, yeah. they float to the surface. It's their way of falling. So falling upwards. And I thought, well, that kind of sums up my bizarre life trajectory. Okay, cool. Because it's a very weird journey. I mean, I didn't start out with a burning desire to become a mime artist or a furry alien or it was a art college wasn't it for you i think is that right you what you were at art college i believe art college yes okay, let me research i um thought i wanted to illustrate children's books which was <laughs> wrong and i got to art school thinking it would be this sort of hotbed of you know incredible chicks and dangerous dudes and stuff and it was like trainee accountants or something you know and i ended up doing graphics and i thought this is wrong I used to walk past a fine art hut and there'd be these dudes in duffel coats chucking paint at canvases and tearing up photocopies and covering themselves in beans or something. <laughs> I thought, like, damn, I should have done this. You know? But I was too scared, so I stuck it out for another two years and I left, moved to Brighton, became a hippie. What was the qualification then? Was it O-levels? Dip A-levels? AD. Dip AD. And what diploma is, of is Art that? and Design. So I guess that's, because I've, I've got a first diploma in a BTEC, so is that the same thing, like between 18 and 20? or? I don't know, darling. This was before you were born, I think. It's pre-university college, though, right? <coughs> you didn't uh, go no, to this, university? No, this, this was. It was, okay. It was a, you know, a diploma in art and design, if I'd stuck it out. <laughs> so I left, I became a hippie. I took a lot of uh, hallucinogenic drugs and explored inner space. <laughs> but that was great. That was so much more fun than because um, I had to get out of my hometown. My hometown it's is kind Red of what Hill. you hoped art school would be. Yes, <laughs> I thought it would be a hotbed of stuff. You know, uh, it was a hotbed of tedium. Anyway, but that's just me. I wasn't very good. What at was the hometown? Design. Red Hill. It's oh, recently sorry. been oh. twinned with Dante's Seventh Circle of Hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me you know it. Well, I used to work for uh, DMG Events, and DMG yeah. have Daily Mail Group have big offices in Red Hill, I Do think, they? I believe uh, now. Okay. So, yeah. Red Hill was sort of, it was a, a coach stop between London and Brighton. Yeah. And eventually people said, hey, we could live here. <laughs> it's it's a shithole, basically. Um, <laughs> are we allowed to swear? If or there's any yeah, listeners yeah, in uh, Red Hill, yeah, you can swear, of course you No, I, I've made no bones about the fact <laughs> that I could not wait to get out. So a, a guy at art school who was a year older than me, which in those days seemed to be a huge age gap, you know, my God, Steve, you're 19. Um, <laughs> he said, hey, my parents have bought me a little cottage, a workman's cottage in Brighton. Mm -hmm. And I, guys just moved out. Do you want to move in? So I did. So I said, yes, I'm out of Red Hill. I'm out of mum and dad's fevered clutches. And we just spent about two years smoking a huge amount of dope, <laughs> listening to a massive amount of music. Steve was very into American music. The Grateful Dead, Quicksilver Messenger Service, you know, Jefferson Airplane. And I was really obsessed with Bowie because I'd seen him live in May 1972. Which tour was this? Was it? This, this was Ziggy? his first UK tour with the Spiders before he became Ziggy. Ziggy hadn't come out yet. Okay. This was in Epsom Town Hall. Epsom is near Red Hill. It's about seven miles away. I was going out with a girl and she said, hey, do you want to go and see David Bowie tonight? I said, David Bowie? what the guy with the teeth and the perm because he'd had this huge hit with Space Oddity three years earlier and a friend of mine had seen Bowie playing in London he said no you've got to see Bowie A he looks like God and he's got the tightest band I've ever seen and heard in my life mm. so I thought I'll go along and we pulled up we walked actually from the tube station uh, train station to this town hall in Epsom and we see this huge long queue of people I thought that's weird and then people sort of... Like, this guy seems popular. Well, it was like everybody seemed to be in on a secret, eh? you know. 
something's about to happen. When we file into this provincial town hall with all these wooden seats laid out and a little stage, no support band. And all of a sudden, the march from A Clockwork Orange kicks off. <laughs> when he calls down, we think, bloody hell. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, dun, 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 he goes into straight into Hang On To Yourself. And there he is, this golden figure in a white... No, he had his pattern jumpsuit on. His hair wasn't red then, it was, mm. but it was that gamang. How was he regarded then? Because um, he was like such oh, a, a chameleon and gender bending in a sense. For the whole gig. He did, he did most of the Ziggy album. Was there a stigma in liking him? And he did the oh, you big. Well, that's why I said what David Bowie, the yeah, yeah. teeth and the perm, because that was all we knew about. Of course, I heard of a band he had called Hype, um, and Feathers as well. He had a trio called Feathers. But anyway, so he did Space Oddity, and he sat on a stool, and he sat on one of his testicles. You know, like guys often do. <laughs> oh, oh and sorry, every woman man. goes, oh, melt. You know, I can massage that better, Dave. <laughs> And he said, oh, I don't normally do that. <laughs> and I just thought, this is unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. You know, I grew up with the fabs and Elvis was, you know, pretty much sex on a stick. Well, this was performance. This was something different. This yeah. was, and he knew that he was going to be huge. That was the thing. I've never seen that with anybody. Mm. Now it's like, if you buy your way in, you can become famous. But he was sure. godlike. And he encored with the Beatles' Love Me Do and Cream's I Feel Free, which is a very strange combination. Mm. And I just thought, that is probably the best thing I will ever see in my life. Three months later, he's, he's done the whole tour. Ziggy's out. He's suddenly gone global. Stratospheric, yeah. Mm. He's playing Croydon Greyhound, which is Croydon is Dante's eighth circle of hell. <laughs> uh, the support band of Roxy Music. Don't write in Croydon listeners. He's, he's joking. He loves you, really. Uh, <laughs> Roxy Music, the support act. is like, hello. And it's Brian Eno. I thought, my God, he's almost as pretty as old Dave. You know? It's a glam's happening. And I just thought, this is it. It's brilliant. So suddenly I've left home and I've got my hands on Hunky Dory, Man Who Sold the World, Ziggy. Mm. And then I remember when we bought uh, Aladdin Sane, we put it on and we'd smoked a massive doobie beforehand. And it was just extraordinary music. It was spiky, icy, space age. Mm. Drive-in Saturday, it was just, Alien. to this day, what an, a lyrically adventurous piece. You know, everyone's, oh, Bowie, he's like Bolin, bollocks. Mm. Sorry, you know. Well, we discussed that, I think, with uh, Steve when he was in. There's the, uh, <coughs> Steve Strange, the last episode, that there's this kind of, like, there was a dual thing in glamour yeah. at the time. There was that football terrace glam of, like, mud, and things. And yeah. Bolin was somewhere in the yeah. middle, and then you've got Barrow, which is this like beautiful art school glam mixed with I know. We, well, we, we've all seen the docs about it, you know, that Bolin got there first, which mm. incensed Bowie enormously. But Bowie had the, the chops, you know. Bolin was good for a few singles. Mm. But Bowie had a lyrical edge and an artistic well, in Mark's edge. defense, he did die, unfortunately. <laughs> so well, damaged his artistic yeah, output. Having said that, Michael Jackson afterwards just came he out thought, Shit, you know what, I really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so did it create anyway. some like crossroads in your the path that you were no, on? No, I suppose. Sorry, I am going to ramble. You have to no, that's no good. ramble. Yeah, this is the whole point no, of it. But it's all wonderful. riveting stuff. It's all really long form. So I'm in Brighton. You know, I'm a ooh, uh, my hair's down here because uh, my hair was naturally wavy. So I had to sellotape it to my chest after I washed it. <laughs> Otherwise, it would shrink. <laughs> It was great until ringlets. I went out in the rain. I, I like, can't whoop. imagine with ringlets. No, oh, it was <laughs> it's all in me book life. Bo Peep. Uh, yes, anyway, <laughs> so um, Steve is really into all these American bands, and I just thought, you know what? It just doesn't do it for me. I mean, I, some of Jefferson Airplane. I liked It's a Beautiful Day very much, and Santana. But I was just so into Bowie, you know, and The Stones and The Who and Manfreds and all that stuff. So as an art student... That, well, I guess kind well, of forget, that's gone left now. it behind and quit. Where, cool. where, uh, where are you as a person in your like your trajectory I'm through life now? What are you just I'm a lava looking? lamp. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in a room in Brighton somewhere, and you have to imagine in 1972, 1973, Brighton was not the sort of hippie theme park it is now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there was one health food shop called Infinity Foods, <laughs> and we go and buy sort of you know bin bags full of. Dirt encrusted parsnips or something because Steve was a veggie, right? So I had to be a veggie. Like, <laughs> and I used to do terrible things like I, I see, hey guys, I'm just nipping out to get a copy of the Evening Argus. I'd nip round to the fish and chip shop, whack down a Savaloy, you know, <laughs> and sneak back in and say, oh, bummer, guys, they were really out of the, you know, the lentil soup, man. 
<laughs> it's just this urge for bacon. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but there was a, a vibrant hippie scene, so everyone knew everyone else. Mm. And you've seen With No One Eye, mm. right? That was it what was it that. was like for us, because our house, well, his Steve's house, was the, um, the kind of nerve center of anybody coming into Brighton. We had people who'd just come out of prison. We had schoolgirls from the... Um, so it was like an open door policy in, in Brighton. Just wandering. It was always a kind of a weird party going on of some yeah, description. But after a year and a half, of, I just thought, you know what, I've really had enough of this. Mm. Mm. Because there was a, everyone did too much acid, and some people mm. flipped out completely. There was a lovely guy called Dennis who, who went over the edge. Yeah. And we stupidly told him that, oh, our fridge isn't working. He said, oh, well, I can fix that then. <laughs> and he took the whole fridge to bits. And so the entire kitchen was immaculately laid out, every single ingredient of like the Like a 3D diagram of a fridge. <laughs> Great, thanks, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> That's really helped a lot. Uh, anyway, I moved back home, and I thought, oh, Christ, I'm back home again now. So um, I put together a cosmic colouring book for stoners and kids with some art school friends. Uh -huh. And that, that's how I met Angie Bowie. This is very odd. Um, this was a cosmic colouring book. Uh, seven artists, you know, it was for hippies, really, but sure. kids loved it. So you, you could fill in all the intricate drawings. It, fairy stories, uh, Art Nouveau, spacey stuff. Mm. You know, it's like Mr. Natural or something, you know. So we did that. And my friends Nina and Trevor um, decided to form a publishing company. That's how we did it. And he borrowed the money from his uncle. We had 25,000 copies printed. Sure. Wrong. And we sent copies to everyone. And... Um, I'm at home one day and Nina phones up and says, hey Tim, we just had a phone call from Angie Bowie's PR lady. I go, yeah, right. She said, no, no, she, Angie's seen the book. She loves it and she wants to meet you guys. I'm thinking, <coughs> We're in. Yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking, how is this possible? Um, so we arranged to meet Angie at her PR woman's office somewhere in She's still working with David at this point because they had a difference of opinion eventually. I'm getting there. Yeah, she oh, created him. Don't rush me. Anyway, so she says, look, I want to do this um, illustrated uh, children's fairy story called Undine. It's about a water sprite. I want to play the water sprite. I love your guys' illustrations. Would you illustrate me as this water sprite? So we go, yeah. And she said, okay, well, look, why don't you come up to my place, our place in Chelsea next mm. week? To wear. I spent an entire week thinking, what the hell am I going to wear? I'm going to David Bowie's house. I've got a pair of, you know, loom pants <laughs> and a pair of platform shoes from Dolces. You know, I've, I've cut my hair off now, so I'm looking fairly contemporary. But I didn't know that it wasn't actually David's house. It was rented from Diana Rigg by Main Man. Mm. But it was this five-story house, white house in Oakley Street in Chelsea. We knock on the doorbell, you know. <laughs> David's in America, unfortunately. Oh, I was going to go, what a Tim on David Bowie. Anyway, this uh, very pretty black girl with bleach blonde hair opens the door. Hi, I'm Danny Everett. Come in. And that's uh, Zoe Bowie's nanny. We meet little Zoe, or Duncan as he is now. Yeah, the film little director. four-year-old with blonde hair down to his waist. <laughs> and there's Angie. And, uh, you know, massive lips, uh, skinny as a rake. Very gracious, very... Mm. Would you guys like some Chablis or do you want to do a couple of limes? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, I'm prep school boy. I'm thinking, well, limes? I, I limes? must not. <laughs> <laughs> I must not fart in class, you know. Um, so we know we have some Chablis then. And we had a couple of splits. And she said, you guys are great. And uh, we met some of their friends. She was actually banging this guy. Maybe I don't know whether I should mention this, but... It. This guy Go called on, Roy Martin, it. who was an actor, who was in a play by Heathcote Williams called Remember the Truth Dentist at the, at the Royal Court. Mm. And he was there, and he looked like Ronnie Wood, but he had the same hair up here, but a very long sort of pigtails, which Sean developed later. Um, and he said, hey, what do you think, Ange? I'm going to wear this one tonight. And he comes down in Ziggy's fucking jumpsuit. I thought, well, that's a bit fresh, isn't it? Cheeky. Can't anyway, we're there, because we went a few times, and... Um, the phone rang and, and she said, oh, I better get that. It's David. I think, oh, I could almost hear his voice. You know. <laughs> anyway, it was just an extraordinary thing. The book never happened. And then mm. she said, right, I want, I'm, I'm with this guy, Peter Clifton. He did the um, Song Remains the Same with Led Zepp. Mm. We want to do the ultimate rock and roll TV show. Dave is going to do it. Zepp are going to do it. Brian Ferry, maybe. 
would you guys design the stage set? Like, oh, production design. So we did. Uh, there's a Polaroid of it somewhere on my pod. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, okay. well, so we did it. Get it out we designed that. a stage set. That, so each circular stage was like a vinyl record. And the backdrop was this huge mixing desk. with a, This is way before you had <laughs> TV screens. So you have trouble finding the materials and stuff and getting all the logistics because no, it was just down to you two. No, it wasn't. We didn't design it architecturally. It was, um, this would look really good. And then some of the would, would be that yeah. some other people would yeah. Department. make it real. The art department. Yeah, so yeah. we met Peter Clifton, the guy who did A Song Remains the Same and stuff, and um, it just fell through, and that was it. All of a sudden, I'm back in fucking Red Hill again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I got a job as a graphic designer with Trevor, who did the coloring book. So we're going into, I've moved out again. I'm now living in a village in Surrey. Mm. We're dr driving into Red Hill every day to design for Hotel International. That was how yeah. exciting my life was. Major <laughs> projects. And I'm sitting there one day and I think a little voice comes into my head and says, hey Tim, why don't you go to London and study mime? And the other me goes, what? He goes, well, you've seen Bowie. You know, you've seen um, Rocky Horror Show. Mm. I saw it in the King's Road when it was um, in the little King's Road theatre. When was that? Is that 74? 75. 75. Tim Curry was in it then. And I'd seen uh, Marcel Marceau. I knew about mime, you know, and I thought, wow, that's really edgy, isn't it? Mm. I'll find out where to do it. So I got a copy of Time Out that said mime classes at the dance centre. Desmond Jones, pound a class. I thought, wow, I can scrape that one. So I started, and the moment I walked into this room in Covent Garden in the dance centre with 20 people, I thought, this is it. I'm home. This mm. is the best choice mm. I've ever made here. And I became obsessed with it. It was like an unknown art form. It's like being a pre-Raphaelite painter. You know, mm. when you, you'd huddle in corners in dark pubs in Victorian London talking about art. Yes. Mm. And this is what it was like. We'd all go to the pub afterwards and um, we'd talk about Marceau and Lindsay Kemp and all this sort of stuff. And we were like a unit, you know. Did it incorporate anything else into it apart from mime? Did no. Any Desmond, always, Desmond Jones was our Just tutor. A lovely man. He worked with the Pythons at... Cambridge, mm. Mm. and uh, he w they went into comedy, he went into mime. And he said, no, mimes are rooted to the earth, but dancers always want to leave it. Sure. They're always going, ooh, it's like this, and mimes are, mm, 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 we're solid, we're rooted. Yeah. Well, Kenny Everett kind of did a pastiche of that in his show, yeah. which was fantastic. Yeah, he did. No, I mean, unfortunately, over the years, you know, the image of a white-faced mime in a striped shirt is um, risible. Mm. But I, I was guilty of that. Uh, so I suddenly I, I, I was doing two days a week and then we did weekends. And then Desmond said, I want to put a mime company together. I want you in it. And there's nine of us. And we did mime festivals and stuff. How does it speak to you as an art form? Why did it hook you so uh, much? It was black and white. Yeah. Uh, it was silent. And uh, it was the art of telling a story without having to rely on script and dialogue. Yeah. So it's purely you're using this body, to yeah. tell a story. And for me, that was great, actually. I, I, I found, with a face like this, you're either going to be a serial killer or a clown. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, I couldn't be a serial killer because people would remember me. But it, it was, the face works for, exp I'm very expressive. Yeah. And so, right. you know, Desmond would always say, okay, less, you know. So it's not facial based or it is facial based, well, it's, it's more, it's, what takes he, precedence, the physicality or the face? Okay, more, or Desmond different? always said that the problem with most actors is they act from here up. Yeah. So the face is doing all the work, the eyes, all mm. the intent is in the eyes and the mouth. But the rest of it is like, hmm. And he said, you know, you've got to Convey be aware character. of every single part of your body. And that's how the robot came about, because there's one exercise in mind called isolation, where you learn how to move every single part of your body independently of the rest of it. Body part so you can move your head or your chest, or your arm and your hand. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that is really quite something. Mm. It's funny because I, when I was at drama school, I liked doing mime, but they did yeah. so little of it versus <coughs> other things. And I yeah, think it really helps. It's a bit like mask work in a sense where you are not present anymore and you go <coughs> away and then the mime. Yeah. I think you can hide behind that in a sense. And I, we didn't do a lot of that at drama school, unfortunately, but it no. was lots of fun. The little we did do, but it's just strange we didn't. I mean, Desmond used to teach, and I think he probably still does at drama schools because it was an integral part of the drama course along with fencing and uh, mm, yeah. 
period so. movement we had that as well yes so. darling snap your vitals and all that mm. um yeah there's something about putting on as soon as i put on the white face for the first time tim first goes away a, yeah tim yeah. went away and this other being who was very confident appeared because i'm not me well you're I was not responsible in my it's like terribly i said shy like, yeah, when you're guy. greek mask work you're not there anymore you can get away with murder because you're yeah. not kind of well, Desmond said, we don't need masks, we just do it with white face. Yeah. yeah. And it was the smell of the, it was um, Max Factor white pancake. And I remember the first time, and you put it on with a damp sponge, and it was like, whoa, hello. Mm. The same thing moment. with body paint as well, kind of thing, I find, anyway. It's like wearing a mask, too. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting you do body thought. painting, Al Alex does body painting, where they, you're naked and they paint no, something onto you, no? No. no. <laughs> I body paint my own face. I, we've been out on a night out, <laughs> and you've been body painted. I know that for a fact. By, by me. To, Tim, just look for a Facebook picture. By me. I promise <laughs> you. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but it's the same thing. It's the same principle, isn't it? You've got something to hide behind. Yeah. Anyway, sort of trying to condense all this into one sort of package. Mm. Uh, one day at mime school, mime class, I meet this lovely sort of bubbly-haired Canadian girl. Yeah, little bright as a button you know we did an impro together where I had to play a fat person and she had to play a really skinny person where we're eating and I thought god she's cute <laughs> and we went to the pub afterwards um, just down the road from Floral Street we got talking about stuff talking you should yes. express yourself yeah. in Miami you're <laughs> in come on <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah we, we as soon as that was off we could talk anyway so she came back to my place. We spent the whole night talking, and the next day we're going out together. This is Barbie Wild. Just day. talking. Bar <laughs> okay, we did just talk the first night, actually. Anyway, I just thought, wow. Um, so I fell hopelessly in love with her, you know, and mm. we, we formed our little mime duo. Mm. And we, we put together a show, and it, it was fairly traditional, really. Um, but one of the things we did, we were... We, we moved out. I had a flat in Holborn, you know, which is a great area because yeah, it it's yeah. completely Central empty at weekends. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> Hectic during the week. But it was, I was seeing an actress before I met Barbie, and uh, she said, well, you can have a room in my flat by the bookmakers in Lamb's Conduit Street. She is one of Hill's Angels, you know, the Benny Hill girls. <laughs> anyway, different story. And, um, Benny Hill show. Barbie said, well, you know, because she'd moved in, uh, we should try and get her own flat, you know. So she went off to try and find someone. She came back one day and said, I found this flat in the King's Road. I said, get off. She goes, no, it's 50 quid a week. I thought, mm. We went to have a look at it. And of course, it's above Vivian Westwood's shop. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we took it. So yeah. we moved in. To is that the world's end or is that Malcolm McLaren's? It was, actually, was sex. It was still seditionaries. Okay. Yeah, it was sex before then. And then it became seditionaries. And there's one funny moment. We A friend of ours had a little van and it, we put all our stuff in the hallway leading into the flat and we're sort of running up and down the stairs taking bits up and it's like four punks in the hallway going it's a bit weird isn't it where's that Johnny Rotten then no this is not the shop this is a private flat the shop's next door <laughs> oh oh thank you it's like what, West Country what punks there <laughs> sort of velvet skirts and heart albums you know because <laughs> we're all still a bit hippie yeah yeah you know? Anyway, round the corner you had Johnson's, which was a great shop, you know, sort of 50s style clothing. You had Boy down the road. That's all the rockabillies Axiom. came out of there, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, but there was this weird shop called Liberated Lady, which was a bit sort of cheesy, really. But they did sort of huge white T-shirts with Brigitte Bardot's face on them or Elvis or something. Or, you know, the, the Tom of Finland, the two cowboys. With yeah, the with the giant legs. cocks and the leather trousers, brown leather anyway, trousers. Anyway, Colin McFarlane ran it and... Um, Barbie used to go in there and get spandex leggings or something, you know. I, I passed on those, actually. <laughs> but uh, he said, look, I'm, I want to revamp the shop. Um, how about you guys being sort of living mannequins in the window? So we thought, yeah, we could do that. You know, it's all about isolation. Sure. So we're just standing in the window. Actually not yeah. moving at all until someone walked past. And then you go... Freak them out. Yeah. They go, whoa, bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck the life out of me. Agnes, thought, come on, look at this. I thought that was real. That's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so we're doing that. And uh, we come out. And there's this weird couple jiving in the shop. And there's no, this guy. He looked, a bit like, <laughs> he looked a bit like Tom Baker meets Robert Powell. He had cheekbones you could slice bread on. You know, <laughs> and this massive curly hair. And this very hot looking blonde girl he's flinging her around you know it's like bloody hell people were ducking you know <laughs> and there was a little tiny stage in, in the shop that Colin had built and um, 
Barbie and I did a couple of mime pieces. There is actually a photograph of me somewhere in leopard skin leggings doing the wall. <laughs> <coughs> uh, anyway, but we got talking to Robert and L.A. and uh, discovered that they lived further down the King's Road. For those listening that have missed it, Robert and L.A. are previous guests, episode two and three. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. Robert yeah, Green. And La- describe La- La- and Richards. Richards. Four. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it? Robert Powell meets Tom Baker. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but with, with a hypermanic edge. You know. <laughs> but we just thought, wow, these people are great. On truck Because we, we were getting a little bit bored with a sort of polite mime thing. Mm. Anyway, so we exchanged phone numbers and I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. About four months later, Barbie goes back to the States to visit her mum and dad. What um, was the thing that attracted you two as couples together? What was the kind of hook... What, what were they doing in, in, in the store? Well, I think they were doing everything that we wouldn't dream of doing. <laughs> right. And I think they appreciated the sort of... Um, the discipline that you guys had. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, good, good point. Um, anyway, so I'm at home on my own thinking, God, I really wish I had a colour telly. Uh, <laughs> and the phone rings. It's Robert. It's, I'm not Tim, it's Robert. That's how Robert speaks. <laughs> oh, we know. Uh, yeah, he's been there. <laughs> Sample that one. Um, he said, Look, I've, got, I, I've got this... No, stop it. I've got this group called Shock, <laughs> and someone's just left. And we've got a gig at this funk club called Monk Breeze next week. Do you want to come along and do a mind piece? Mm. I thought, wow, okay. What the hell can I do? I had a little piece I used to do about a beggar who would do anything to try and get money. So he'd chop his arm off. <laughs> and he'd, oh, that didn't work. Well, I'd chop a leg off. <laughs> and I said, okay, Robert, can you bring me on in a large bag? So he brought me on. He just unceremoniously dumped me on the back of the stage while they're doing all this chucking and dancing and all this. Here's the and mile. then I emerge and I've got white face and a red clown nose on and a, a shabby Mac and I do this whole sort of help me begging thing. And all these black guys in tight white trousers who I thought were going to hate me, they're all going, yeah, brilliant. And Robert says, right, well, that's it. You've got to join the group. I said, well, I'll join if Barbie joins. He said, oh, oh, right, okay. So Barbie comes back. I say, guess what? We're in this group called Shock now. <laughs> and, and the reason it worked is because up until then, Shock were like a disco dance group. Yeah. And so we disco brought in this kind of, um, yeah. Disco theatre, sorry, that's what they Sort of called. discipline, but theatrical, Theatical-y historical kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Barbie and I used to do little robot numbers uh, while they were frenetically dancing. There's a great song called I Have a Destiny. I can't remember who it was by now. But all of a sudden... I've gone from fringe theatre, you know, with mm. 14 men and a dog, going, oh, yeah, that's rather ma- marvellous, isn't it, that mime stuff? <coughs> and we were in sort of clubs like Wedges and the King's Road, owned by Di Llewellyn, and... Uh, Coming this, like, burlesque mixing pop mashup. Posh people. You know, because I don't come from posh, no. nor does Barbie. Um, there was a club called The Alley, which was off New Bond Street, run by a fabulous Chinese guy. He used to... What was his name? Anyway... But he used to sit at the bar going, fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> the S went on for about 10 minutes. And, and the stage was about this big. But we'd do our stuff, you know. And, and people say, wow, this is really brilliant. Because I would get a frog mask on and Barbie and I would do a sort of courtship of Froggy and Princess and stuff. <laughs> and then we're still doing mime classes. And I met this pretty boy <coughs> one night called Sean. And he had this long tweed overcoat on with a piece of string around it. I thought, that's weird. He had great hair. He had a Bowie look. Bastard. It's like with nail to your eye or vice versa. Yeah, Yeah. perfect hair. Very pretty. Great cheekbones. Bastard. Uh, We got talking in the pub and he said, oh, I've got this little thing I do. I call myself Plastic Joe. And um, I want to be as much like a machine as is humanly possible. I've got this black PVC one piece, like jumpsuit, gloves. And I cover myself with makeup and I put gel over it so it looks like I'm melting. (laughs) And I just don't move at all. I said, wow, that is brilliant. You've got to join this group I'm in called Shock. So, so he's he mime as well, right? He's yeah, so now we've got <coughs> three mimes and three dancers. So the balance of power. Who's it called? <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, this is now really something. See, Robert and L.A. and Karen, who was the third dancer, that covered, you know, the, the sort of disco dolly thing. Sure. Um, but all of a sudden, Robert sort of said, hey, you got to hear this music like psychedelic first sister europe uh, the cure yeah forest I, wow i'd heard craft work obviously from the robot not like the robot the model and stuff um daf you know this sort of thunderous electronic sure stuff i thought wow this is very exciting 
What year are we in now? Are we in we're like, in 1979 or? We've just come out of 79 now. Okay. We're in 1980. 1980. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how. We, we suddenly had a, a manager, this guy called Ian Burton and his partner. And they managed Hot Gossip. Uh, do you remember Hot Gossip? Mm. Mm. So the mixed race uh, dance group. Well, what's yeah. this? Came Billy Idol's with? longtime girlfriend slash wife was in that, wasn't she? Who? Uh, what was her name? Long time slash wife. He married her, I think, eventually, and had children with her, Billy Idol. Uh, oh, God, what's the name? Perry Lister. Perry Lister, that's it. Mm. Real Thank idea. you. Uh, yes, no, they were, they were quite raunchy, um, but they were very drilled. Yeah. It was Arlene Phillips, you know, who was mm. like sort of the Hitler of the uh, <laughs> like Nazi Bob Fosse. So Shock were very undisciplined. I mean, we never rehearsed anything, mm. but we would get the gigs that Hot Gossip didn't want to do, so suddenly our manager says, well... Hot Gossip don't want to do 12 nights in Bangkok. Do you want to do it? Like, mm. Yeah, okay. And would this be at the... Because you went <laughs> on to support... We'll come to this eventually, of yeah, course. Yeah, no, eventually. You were supporting or you were presenting yourselves as a group and that was the act. We're, we're still you a kind of disco dance mind group. So it's disco theatre. We're, not, hip, we're yeah. not shock yet, no. No, okay. no we, we are shock, but okay. we're not hip yet. So we go out to Bangkok and four days beforehand, Sean says, oh, fuck, I haven't renewed my passport. <laughs> what a total... Dickhead. <laughs> so we have, we have to go out as a five piece. He loves you really, Sean. <laughs> Don't worry, we've gone over this. <laughs> but it was just like, oh, we have to do a, a set that is twice as long as our normal show, which sure. is only about 35 minutes. We've got to do just an hour it. without Sean. It's like, oh, no. So I'm really doubling up, you know. And we get to all the way to Bangkok via a one night in Cairo Hilton or something. Robert is going mad. You know, he's hyper, hyper. <laughs> and uh, we get to the club and the, and the owner comes out. He's limping badly. And he said, oh, uh, oh, yeah, I had an accident with my gun you know, the other day. Uh, we'd actually been shot by an, another club promoter. It's like, okay, we're here for 12 days. <laughs> uh, we met a policeman called Lieutenant Pierpont who um, took a fancy to me and Robert. He took us out to shoot his magnum. He was obsessed with... Is that a euphemism? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> No, but he, he had a silver-plated forty-five Magnum. He said, Cock this, I'll discharge a load for you. Oh, it's very horny, firing a gun, I tell you. Anyway, so that was, you know, there were hookers in the hotel and Arabs with suitcases full of Thai stick. Um, it was a very strange... What's Thai stick? What's that? He's Ganja Manini. Oh, okay. Oh, narrow escapes from stuff, you know. It was very, very strange. But what happened was that Robert actually, because he's... He won't mind me saying this. He was hyperactive mm. and he used to go running mm. every day to get rid of this stuff. Yeah. And of course, in Thailand, if you go running, you're dead. <laughs> and he just went completely mad. He ended up not speaking to any of us for the rest of the week. And why is that? Because it's such a lawless place. It's still is to some extent, but I, no, I'm sure back it's then it's just that he couldn't, he, he couldn't deal with the fact that he couldn't burn off this energy. He could right. burn off some of it on stage. Yeah. yeah. But he'd come off stage, he'd be steaming like a racehorse. It yeah. was quite extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. So we had to be very kind of ooh, circumspect about this. Mm. And um, anyway, he finally sort of plateaued out and we came back. And then all of a sudden, he comes in and says, oh, I've just met this guy called Rusty Egan. <laughs> Robert knows everybody in London, you know. <laughs> it's just like, wow, okay. So we meet Rusty. He says, yeah, yeah, I'm doing... No, don't do the accent, don't you? Anyway, he says, I've done this backing track with this bloke called Richard James Burgess. He's got a band called Landscape. And it's a cover version of the Glitter Band song, Angel Face. It's a techno, electro version. Mm -hmm. And we've got Jerry Shepard, who wrote it, who's singing it. But we need some girls on it, and we need someone to front it. How, how about Shock fronting it? So we went, yeah, OK. So suddenly, we're signed to RCA Records. Yeah. Whoa. Bloody That's hell. a jump. Mm. It's a great it track as well. I mean, Still Barbie and good. L.A. sang on backing vocals on Angel Face. Face, 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 face. Uh, Robert, Sean and I aren't on it at all. Uh, the B-side is only R Richard and Rusty. Mm. But Richard and I, I said, look, I write lyrics. Do you fancy doing some of them? So we said, yeah. So we started writing together. So we wrote a song called Dynamo Beat, another, another song called Dream Games and um, yeah, we've got now we're that. suddenly we're, we've gone from the posh clubs we've, everyone looked like Joan Collins or Omar Sharif in these clubs lots of women in leopard skin and it was like a scene from the bitch or the stud yeah. and I thought this is not me 
you know, I'm really not happy here. That's the Joan Collins kind of semi-erotic <coughs> uh, film so now, the novel, uh, isn't it? We're hanging out at the Blitz, and we did a... Tuesday night was Blitz night. <coughs> and we used to know a lovely couple called Biddy and Eve. You must know Eve Ferret. Mm-hmm. Um, Biddy was her musical partner. And um, they got us a gig at Blitz on a Tuesday night, which is when Boy George was the cloakroom attendant. And we went down like a bag of cold sick, actually. Really? <laughs> everyone was too busy looking at themselves. Well, I thought they'd appreciate that, because no, it's like cabaret no, no, burlesque, you like, were kind of inventing it. Distracting that. time. Every, everyone was in the ladies doing their hair. Oh. And all the ladies were in the gents, you know. It was, <laughs> it was very odd. I mean, I know it's become a myth now, this whole culture of blitz, you know. It was basically a lot of St. Martin's uh, fashion students and wannabe musicians um, enjoying dressing up. I know everyone's Gary Kemp's always go, oh, London was so grey and dreary in 1979. Sure. I didn't notice that. Mm. I was having a great time. Yes. People say, yeah. Robert, Robert, Robert Elm said that. You well, seemed like they were having a great time. <laughs> you know, but, oh, there were mounds of rotting garbage bags everywhere. Covent Garden was a seedy, rundown place. I mm. thought, really? Okay. So we're in the Blitz, and we're hanging out at the Hell, Le Kilt, Beetroot. Yeah, Steve mentioned Hanging that. out with um, the Spandau boys. I liked. They were nice boys. Because Richard was producing them, so we yeah. see them. Martin and, and Gary, very nice. Was there a lot of, I mean, it's become legend now, like you just said, myth, if you will. Uh, was there a lot of focus from the world at large on the Blitz at that point? Was it kind of the um, place to be, the place to be seen? No, Local not companies at that were coming point. It was, still, it was still underground. I mean, sure. what happened was that Steve and, and Rusty decided to do... Um, Bowie Nights in, was it Soho, no, wasn't no, it? No, Chronologically, what happened, Rusty and Steve started Bowie Nights at Billy's. Sure. Then they needed somewhere bigger. So that's when they got the Blitz, which is a 40s-themed wine bar. Yeah. And that is pretty odd, because you've got all these sort of peacock punks yeah. with all this sort of, you know, careless talk costs lives yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sort of, you know, drink cider acts or something. All um, very smoky kind of, uh, yeah, a themed wine bar. Yeah, it's war paraphernalia. Odd. It wasn't sort of, you know, like a, a scene from... Satyricon or something. No. <laughs> Hell was a bit better. That was all red and that was quite dark. The kilt was all tartan. And then Sean... No, Robert came rushing in one day because we all lived in Chelsea. It was very strange. Sean was in Knightsbridge and we got Carol in the group now, Carol Kaplan, and mm. she lived in the other end of King's Road. Robert comes running in one day and says, I found, I found this incredible shop in the Great Deer Market called Carnivorous. Uh, Carl and Bell, sorry. And they're two girls from Birmingham and they made this incredible clothing. So we all went in there and I said, and Barbie said, and Sean said, wow, I'm having this. This was like um, sort of samurai meets gothic meets, you know, it's huge shoulders, studs, fur, leather. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's almost like the seeds of, I guess, what you get now, which is burlesque and fetish in a sense. Um, I think seeing some of the pictures of you, it but it wasn't... (coughs) wasn't so much sexual it was more um, no I did well in that like sense it's the kind of the look yeah but very, it's very romantic I mean if you look at Jane Carl and Patty Bell the clothing they made was like fairy princess outfits but they'd, they'd be a sort of dragon motif on it or a darker element so Sean the suddenly is in love with Jane and so they're a couple which which is great because we got all our clothes made for them <laughs> but and then Jane says oh I've been I used to go out with this guy called Simon and he's got a a, a group from Birmingham and they're playing at the venue next week. Oh yeah, they're called Duran Duran. Do you want to go along and see them? <laughs> yeah, sure. I thought, wow, they're great. Because they weren't up themselves. The thing about Spandau, and I'm sure, mm. well, <laughs> if you don't like it, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> they were very precious about it and that's how it worked for them because they said, we don't want to do conventional rock and roll gigs. We play h and Belfast, we're playing the Blitz. We don't want to do rock and roll. Duran said, we are fucking going to be huge. We are doing rock and roll. We're going to take coke. We're going to have Anthony Price suits. We're going to have supermodel. We're going for it big time. Yeah, and it works as well. Mm. So it was always, mm, do you like Duran or do you like the Spans? You know, and I pref- musically I preferred Duran because they were more Beatley. Mm. Uh, the Spans going more into sort of a funky area. I didn't really have reference for that. 
So we suddenly were hanging out with Duran Duran. It's like, Jesus. And they did the venue just before Planet Earth came out. And again, it's like the Bowie thing. It's like, whoa, these guys are going to be huge. Well, I think Simon's in the video, isn't he, with that frilly shirt and stuff and the eyeliner and the black hair. It looks awesome. Like all of them and Nick Rhodes. and They, yeah, were, they were actually very good looking boys. Maybe Andy wasn't quite so. But certainly Nick and John and Simon were. I mean, mm. I always thought Simon was the eldest of the new romantic group. There's one moment when he dyed his hair black. And he hasn't aged either, hair. weirdly, or Yasmin. Like, what's going on with that? Monkey glands. Stem cells. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so of <laughs> all of a sudden, everything's hunky-dory and cool. I'm signed to RCA Records. You know, I've got Barbie. I've got great clothes. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm getting a huge amount of press. Shock are doing tours with bands like Theatre of Hate and Blamange and Naked. <laughs> and we're suddenly we're going up and down the M1 all the time. It's like, oh no, this is what... Are you having any moments like. when all this is happening going, how the fuck did all this yes. happen? I was like, a yeah, year or two years ago, I was at art college. A lava lamp yeah. on a cushion in Brighton. And all of a sudden, oh, I've got to tell you my Lindsay Kemp story. <laughs> um, before all the shock stuff happened... And you were still doing more training mine and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and before I met Barbie, I saw in Time Out, Lindsay Kemp workshops... Um, it was a, what do you call it, like a town hall, not a town hall, uh, some village hall in Fulham. You know, so I thought, fuck, I'm going along to this. You know, Lindsay Kemi taught Bowie, oh God. And uh, I'd seen Flowers and I'd seen Salome and I just thought this is the most extraordinary theatrical experience. That was one of the things that clinched it for me to go and try and do it myself. Go for it properly. Mm. I don't yeah. know whether you know Jean Genet's Flowers. Uh, it was an extraordinary spectacle. And Lindsay's version of Salome, you know, the Oscar Wilde. Yeah. It started with, um, well, Flowers started with this angel who was this gorgeous boy uh, cli- with wings, just wearing a sort of loincloth, climbing down this scaffolding with, you know, big, pouty red lips, black eyes, slick back, black hair. And I thought, bloody hell, you know. Uh, and then it's just kicked off into this sort of decadent, you know, it's a mixture of mime and dance. And I, and I thought, well, I'm not a dancer, but I wanted to go along and see what Lindsay's classes were like. So I turn up at this church hall, church hall in Fulham, and, and I think, oh, God, it's all very pretty boys, all sort of limbering up, doing the splits and all this sort of stuff. And they're all, hello, darling. And there's a few girls there. And then I saw one, she was gorgeous. She had a sort of auburn hair and she was wearing a leotard and she was sort of limbering up. And I thought, blimey, she's fit. <laughs> well, it transpired later, that was Kate Bush, you know. But right. um, <laughs> she hadn't done Wuthering Heights yet. But mm. She would look like Liz Taylor in a leotard. I thought, oh, must have. <clears throat> so did Lindsay Kemp choreograph the Heathcliff video when she's kind no. of doing all that? No, no, no. But anyway, so... Lindsay he does a lot of, he said, right, you're all sheaves of wheat dying on the, <laughs> under the hot sun. But yeah, I can do this. And you always sort of sneak a look, don't you, to see what someone else is doing. And you're all going, oh, yeah. Tableaus. <laughs> yeah. And then, right, now you're reborn. <laughs> rising up, rising up. I can do this. The this wind is, is blowing and the sun's shining. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm liking this. And then he says, right. Uh, I want you all to line up over there, and this is your your only chance to dance your way into heaven, <laughs> to impress St. Peter. And I'm, now my balls are going, oh no, because these are dancers. Yeah. Uh, I think, wrong, I'll go to the back of the queue. Wrong, because all these sylphs are going, oh, girls are going spin, 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 land, bit of Wuthering Heights stuff, and then they're all over there, and it's only me left. Uh-huh. And I think, what am I going to do? I, can't, I don't dance. Mm. So I think what I did, I, I charged out, leapt up into the air, landed like some kind of arthritic horse, <laughs> and um, <laughs> did a bit of slightly robotic stuff, yeah. and walked off. And Lindsay said, well, I don't think St. Peter's going to be opening his gates to you just yet, darling. <laughs> I'll get my coat. And that was it. Whoa. I slunk out, you know, oh. hi, Kate. <laughs> Do you have any props of doing something alternative or different or pushing the boat out with a different idea? You are. L- Lindsay, like you were doing this robotic stuff, why would, why would he... Oh, oh no, but it, Lindsay's into beautiful boys who dance, you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> but I just, I wanted to see what it's like. One thing he did say was always remember the overhead cameras. 
And I thought, that's clever, because, you know, like I said earlier, actors are very good at acting from the neck up. Well, also, a lot of performers are always playing to you. Mm. But what about him there? What yeah. about him up there? So you've got to be Bob's, aware yeah. of everything. And I was thinking about it on the way here that I... Bowie came, he went to America and did everything, Young Americans, you know, Man Fell to Earth. Yeah. Finally he comes back and he's doing the Station to Station tour. And uh, my friend Julian and I, who I was at art school with, got tickets to see him at Empire Pool, Wembley. You know. <coughs> the only tickets we, we could get were behind the stage. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, sod it. But we were there anyway. And it's 76, so Station to Station has come out. And... Uh, you know the intro to Station to Station? Yeah, dun, yeah. Dun, 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 come on. And 15 minutes later, come on, where is he? <laughs> it's like Eventually, rock. he strolls out. And there he is, the hair is orange, slipped back, white shirt, black waistcoat, black peg pants, gauze in his hand. And he strolls towards the front of the stage. And then he stops and he turns around and he waves at us. And I thought, that is so cool. He remembers. Because he was playing to the fat people. Yeah. And that was a gig. That was, well, okay. No support act. He played the whole of Radioactivity by Kraftwerk <laughs> and showed the movie by Dali and Boomwell. Oh, really? Channel, Channel Blue. Blue, yeah. That was the support act. So <laughs> all these people are going, what the fuck? Uh, I didn't think that s five years later I'd be on that same stage supporting yeah. Gary Newman. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's not the telecon tour, is it? As long as <laughs> you want. Oh, oh cool. <coughs> Hours, weeks, anything you want. Have some more wine, Tim. I will. So you're, uh, when you get to the Newman, it's you're right in, you're in show. It is right <laughs> Oh, you, how did we get to Newman now? You're probably thinking that. Well, you, right? you're in. You, you, we done, when we've done all the Blitzy stuff, we're doing yeah. that. Duran, blah, blah. Uh, we used to play at the Embassy Club in Bond Street. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we've done a gig there, and we're in the bar afterwards. And we think, fucking hell, there's a Gary Newman on there. Standing there with a can of coke, a little red bit in his hair. I wasn't very keen on his music, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, it was odd. I liked Ultravox, you know, when John Fox was in them. Mm. And I liked uh, Kraftwerk. And, um, but I always thought he was a bit too odd, a little bit too... Well, he was very alien, wasn't he? He didn't yeah. emote, he was just like that. Yes, <coughs> and he was, was I sort white. of liked that. Mm. But he says, well, I was so nervous that I, I just couldn't oh. bring myself to move. Mm -hmm. oh. And his skin was very bad, so we, we got the makeup girl on top of the pots to really... Plaster it on. Yeah. 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 And, that gate and the eyes, got to have the eyes out. And I Could have done with some of your training. Exactly. Yeah. Body, yeah. But he was, here in Mark, oh, it's like, okay. <coughs> All of a sudden, we're in the embassy club, and Gary's there, and he doesn't talk to anybody. He's very, very shy. Uh, so we go up and go, hi, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> You're my best mate. Uh, he said, look, I've, I've got these shows coming up at Wembley. You know, I'm sort of retiring. I thought, really? <laughs> Hang on. You've, you've just started. For two years, what's <laughs> going on? Oh, you're doing a Bowie thing. Okay. He said, would you guys support me? Three nights, Wembley Arena. Mm. No. So what do you think, Robert? Oh, Bobby. Mm. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think the fact that he had the hots for Carol might have swung it. Um... So all of a sudden, it's we're Carol we're Chaplin, right? She was Captain. the guru yeah, Captain. Captain. of Cherry Blair's guru, yes, Tony Blair's. Yes, 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 yes. The first lady. Yeah, ah, she's a lovely girl. Very, very sweet lady. Anyway, um, so we're get down at Shepparton rehearsing, and the stage set, uh, you must have seen pictures of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've seen a million pictures. So I know it's it's just, I've seen, you can see it on YouTube the whole when thing, but you, it's that. Uh, in front of it, you just think, oh, this is... You know, the Bo Bowie's, um, obviously the two early gigs of his I saw, there was no stage set. It was just light and him, which is what he wanted, really. The Station to Station tour was pure white light, just bars of it and mm. spots and everything. There was no set. Mm. And the band, you couldn't even see the band. It's like, hello, Dave. Uh, but Gary is like, right, this is, ah, oh, it was a fantastic opening. Do, 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 do. And the whole building shook. He had bass bins, because the Empire Pool used to be a swimming pool. Oh, you know? right. So it was hollow underneath. Yeah. So he put all the bass bins in, in where the, the pool. Um, yeah. Huh. So when, it, when the low notes kicked in, it's like. You could feel it in your chest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he had these two guys with his oxygen cylinders on their back who were sort of. Very Star Wars moment, actually. Uh, they'd sort of climb up. Or no, they'd be. 
It was like they had a rocket pack on, mm. and they were on either side of the stage. And then these two circular panels of light would start to spin round and round, and the band kick off, and you just think, fucking hell. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard. Mm. It was so powerful. And he comes up, and I think, mm, okay. Um, the deal was, if, we d if the three girls did something with him, and Sean and I did our tick and tock thing, mm. uh, they would film our set. Sure. <coughs> and when they had a huge curtain covering up Gary's set, but we still had big suites. We were only, you know, dancers and mimes. We didn't have any props or anything. Mm. So we had plenty of room. And uh, everyone said, well, that's the best support act I've ever seen in my life. You know. uh. And it's 40 minutes, and it complemented him perfectly because we didn't have roadies with bum cracks and leads and amps yeah. and kits and all that. It was just us. Yeah. And... Uh, Yes, it, it was. That was an extraordinary moment, actually. That was that was when we went. We went mega. If you in in a small way, <coughs> megaret. <laughs> Warm mega. Mega squared. <coughs> um, oh, I was going to. Sorry, I'm 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 firing on all cylinders. It's fire away. There's so much info that it, yeah. it's very hard to be sort of concise and okay. Well, then that happened because my mind says, oh, what about? Oh, we did. When you, because you said earlier the Blitz thing, right? Was it, you know, did it get as much attention, thank you, as it does now? No, it didn't. Right. But Rusty and Steve said, okay, we got, we're going to do a really, really big show at the Rainbow Theatre in Finsbury Park, which is where Bowie did his major breakthrough gig. It used to be the Finsbury Park Astoria, as featured in Breaking Glass, the movie with Hayes O'Connor. Oh, no. I don't know. Anyway, so it was called the People's Palace. That was the Valentine's Ball, February the 14th, 1981. Uh, Shock are supporting Depeche Mode are on. Uh, Ronnie, Germanic, French girl singer. Uh, Ultra Vox. Ultra Vox, yeah. They just, just gone global with Vien Vienna. And every peacock punk, as they... And then how called? It's like, hang on, what are we? New romantic blitzkids. Cult with no name. The cult with no name. The Made a one. real cult yeah. of himself. Um, Peacock punk. Oh, come on, you know. But anyway, so that was when it suddenly the media thought, wow, must have some of this. And that was it. Everyone said, oh, fuck, it's over. It's what like was, anything. You know? What was your look when you weren't well off duty? Of course. What, oh, well, that was some the of thing the pictures I've seen of you. You look quite punk. <coughs> like you got like it was twenty four seven, man. Yeah. It's, it's not like, you know. It's we, a lifestyle. We, yes, place, we, yeah. we take the slap off and get into jeans and a romper suit. You know, yeah. it was, um, especially for Sean and I, it was full on. All you the were time. tick and tock then? Ah, oh. yes, I've forgotten that. Okay, <laughs> what happened in 1980 in July? There was a hiatus, shockwise, where Barbie went back to the States to visit mum and dad. LA went to Wales. Robert went, <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, I'm at home again, thinking, God, I wish I had a colour telly. Uh, I've got one. Oh, good. Uh, Sean phones up and says, do you want to go busking tonight? I said, oh, she <laughs> moves that close to Sorry. Your darling. There we go. Do you want to go busking tonight? I said, what do you mean go busking? What? Streets of London. Mine right? busking. Come on, we could do it. I thought, I don't sing. I haven't got an instrument. He said, no, 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 we do the robot. <laughs> really? See, but you've got a, uh, a dinner suit, you know, white shirt, bow tie. For some reason I did have, I don't know why wasn't sort of part of our outfit. We've got white face on. He said, we'll, we'll go around to San Lorenzo and Beach and Place. And we'll just stand there until someone comes out. And then we'll move. And we put a top hat down. So we're standing there, you know, we've got the shades on so nobody can see your eyes. Okay, someone's coming. Oh, darling, look at that. That's fabulous. I'm chucking lots of money into your hat. <laughs> And we thought, wow, we made about 20 quid that night. We thought, fuck, let's do this tomorrow. That's half then we rent. went to Annabelle's outside in Berkeley uh -huh. Square. Same yeah. thing. Oh, darling, look at these. They're so sweet, aren't they? And the tall one, he's you know, strange looking. But they, <laughs> no, it's like pe you get people standing right here going, oh, I think they're as good as each other, actually. No, I think the pretty ones have No, no, the, the one with the big nose. He's, shut up, I'm right here. <laughs> but you, you just blank out and you just go, zzz, frighten people. And um, so we thought, this is great. Mm. And we did it every night. Mm. 
And Sean said, okay, I think we should call ourselves Tick and Top. I said, that is brilliant. Tick and Top from Shop. Slips yeah. off the tongue. Which one is Tick and which one I is Tuck or does it can matter? Can we spell it T-I-K, not T-O-C-K, see? So suddenly we're Tick and Top from Shop. Barbie comes back, LA comes back, and guess what? We've got Tick and Top. We go, oh no. Uh, <laughs> but we'd incorporated the robot into Shop now. Mm. And we used to kick off the show with Sean and I in our gold suits we had made for this hair show. <laughs> yeah. And they were huge things. You, you had to go through doorways sideways. <laughs> um, Kenny Everett's shoulders. I remember we did a gig in Aberdeen University and the music would start and just be sort of... The lights would come up and there's Sean and I on either side of the stage and all these pissed up Scott students go, what the oh, fuck is, is this? <laughs> Chucking stuff, you know. And Don't break character, oh, Sean. Oh no, what can we do? Keep going, you know. And then the girls come out dancing and they go, yeah! <laughs> and that was it. We had to barricade ourselves in the dressing room. We had to placate room. the art with some <laughs> naked ladies. Oh. <laughs> no, but you know, robots and dancing girls, how could it possibly be? How long did a tick and tock gig last then when you were doing it just as a two? Because you said you, went, you had to stretch the narrative with shock that once to an hour when you were in well, that, Bangkok. That was only that time, yeah. What did you do for uh, tick and tock? Well, we didn't have a show on our own at that it's point. Just okay. We just busted. Yeah, yeah. We turned up to do Covent Garden for the first time. Because in those days, uh, you just turned up. Yeah, mm. you didn't have to book it and stuff. Nah. Like that. Um, so, we're, okay, we're standing behind the pillars in the portico. And then we didn't have any music or anything. We just sort of came out. <laughs> and people go, bloody hell, what is that? Because no one had seen this stuff yeah. in England anyway. Well, it's, uh, was it in America as well, though? Well, you've got the birth of uh, <coughs> body popping and rap. And no, no, that all came later. Um, so you're the pioneer. No, 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 not... We... Uh, amplified it. There, were, there was an American couple called Shields and Yarnell. They used to do Saturday Night Live and other shows, and they were brilliant. They were a married couple. Right. But they do a whole domestic robot scene where they're having breakfast. And, and they, they used to have a soundtrack. So and they'd make cornflakes, and he'd spill it all over her. And, and they were, he was very good. He had a pipe and a dressing gown. And their technique and their discipline was brilliant. Mm. It really, and they were very popular in the States. So I think Barbie had said, oh, look, there's this American couple who do that. And there was a, an offshoot of hot gossip called Spanooch. They had a guy who did a sort of puppet thing. And Sean and I thought, okay, well, we'll add that then. So I'm not saying we invented it, we perfected it. Mm. And we decided then to, if we had an extraordinary image as well, what's happening? No, no, nothing. Not nothing about to blow joking. up, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> if we had an extraordinary Checking image, our thank you, Jane Khan, um, and we got this strange movement, uh, all we need to do next is make some music, hence Tick and Top. Because Robert, is Shock still Robert and LA announced time? on stage at the Lyceum at our peak of our popularity, we finally got a headlining gig at the Lyceum. About to go stratospheric. As LA said the other week, you <coughs> know, she was a sheep, she followed where Robert led. But we're doing Dynamo Beat, and before it, Robert says, oh, me and LA are leaving the group. It's like, what just happened? The elephant walks into the room, you know, mm. it's like, when we came off, saying, you know, leaving. No sort of... There was no rationalising, <coughs> no, we were about to go big boredom. and this is all happening and stuff. And Bawdy, bawdy, bawdy boy, you know. So mm -hmm. we had other gigs to... Um, Cancel? Or no, we had to fulfil them. Oh, you did them, right. okay. Well, we did a gig in a horrible club in Newport in South Wales called Stowaways and Robert dropped LA and broke her arm. Oh, yeah, to she told her. us that, actually. Yeah, yeah, had to take her to casualty. And Barbie and I, I remember looking at Barbie and saying, this is over, isn't it? And it was just, oh, for say you know this, this, we would everyone loved shock we yeah. got press didn't do a lot of tv but we'd had a single out well you would have eventually hip yeah. hip hipsters you know yeah. uh so we carried on as a four piece after that but sean and i didn't mind so much because we'd already got tick and tock on the go much right. to carol and barbie's probably displeasure which caused barbie and i to split up as a couple you know it's a bit mm, it's a tricky one that anyway so I thought, well, we've got to get out of our RCA record deal then. Because there's no point. We're signed as shock. We're mm. not shock anymore. Couldn't you replace Robert or 
LA. No, we tried. We had a. Uh, sorry, am I loud enough? No, no, this is great. Yeah, perfect. Are you ready for my close up? Um, we thought, okay, how, we can't replace Robert. That's ridiculous. You know, that's like Elvis has left. It would get Cliff in. You know, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. uh, so we got a, um, a male bodybuilder in, <laughs> as you do. And uh, a lady with a seven-foot python who was naked apart from a little thongette mm. who covered herself in gold. Uh, so I, in terms of replacing, I didn't mean that. I just meant in terms of, I think, the idea of shock and the concept was so strong. It was all bring over, in new players, as it were. To, no, you know? yeah. Robert, don't get me wrong, shock wouldn't have happened without Robert. Mm. Robert was the motivator. Uh, and if Robert had had more discipline, shock could have really been an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Mm. because we were moving into making music and we could do movies. We were up for the opening of The Hunger, you know, the Bowie Yeah, film. the Vampire of Tony oh, Scott yeah. film. Yeah, they wanted shock. Really? But they wow. gave it to Bauhaus in the end, which was actually a much better choice, I think. We were too vaudeville for that. But anyway, it was, uh, it was very difficult. When you see, you know, that train, I know it's being described by other people like that, but that train comes along not yeah. very often, so you grab it. Yeah. yeah, and then suddenly it's it's in a siding. You think, ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So we struggled on. We did a few gigs. We did a good gig at Heaven, but really, Sean and I thought we've just got to get going now. So due to another motivating force, the girls, the other you know. things are falling away. So I said I want to do a cover version of "Somewhere in the City" by The Loving Spoonful. Sean <laughs> has no knowledge of music. He doesn't understand music. It doesn't click for him. But I've always loved songs and melody, and I just thought, wouldn't it be weird if two robots did Hot Town, Somewhere in the City? So the music's reinvented, but it's, the, it's a cover. So covering, but you're not singing because you're mimes, right? No, I'm singing on it. Oh, you are singing, okay. Yeah. No, I sang on two shock songs as I was well. thinking about your, your mimes I've as well. So how does, how, how does am the, I doing this? How does the mime marry into this thing when you start singing? Well, it shouldn't. You, but you break the fourth it, wall, as it, it were. It worked for Kate Bush and David Bowie, didn't it? <laughs> you know? That you can. That was th that was always the problem. Certainly for Sean and I, as Tick and Top, was that: Are you lovable robots or are you pop stars? Pop stars? Yeah. So we thought, well, can't we be both? Yeah. And consensus was no, not really. And that's four years later. It, it all got a bit confusing, you know. Well, it must have got you some some notice because you started bleeding into film acting then. Bleeding into film <laughs> acting. Yeah. Bleeding. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into on the to Star iconic. Wars then. Oh, it's Star Wars first, isn't it? We'll come. Oopsie. Very so easy. So, Chicken Talker off. We've, you know, we haven't done a record yet, but uh, we're working on it. Mm. And uh, we get a phone call from Desmond, our mime tutor, who says, "Look, I've been contacted by the producers of." the new Star Wars movie. They're looking for mimes for creature parts in the new movie. This is like, gunk, you know. That's another Bowie moment. Fuck, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, this is, for anyone who doesn't know, this is a Return of the Jedi team. Yes, episode yeah. six. Yeah. So it Star is Wars now. is in full bloom. It's like a world phenomenon. It's been happening since 77. So Barbie and I went to see Close Encounters, and before that started, they showed the trailer for... Star Wars. Yeah, the first one, Hope. 77. And we sat there thinking, my God, when that ship goes over. Yeah. And, and, over, and, and over and, and over and over and over. And we just thought, we've got to see this movie. And we saw it when it came out and just thought, wow, this is what sci-fi should be. Because 2001 was great, but it was mm. very sterile. sterile. Yeah. Yes. But this was high Cerebral. noon in space. You know, this yeah. is a love affair. And you've got the baddie and you've got the goodie and you've got the wise old man and the evil. Was it the Joseph Campbell archetypes of uh, adventure? Absolutely. And George Lucas always said that I wouldn't have been able to create this without Joseph Campbell. Is, is it the hero's journey? Is it the book or the, uh, is some the, the hero? The hero with a thousand faces. That's it, yeah. Um, or was that David Bowie? No. <laughs> uh, so, it, so this is now episode three. I mean, yeah, it was episode three. I mean, he said it's going to be called Revenge of the Jedi. So there's about 25 of us mimes go along to Desmond's school and there's Robert Watts, the producer, I think maybe a casting lady. And Desmond said, right, you know, just do some alien movement. <laughs> what? I mean, it's okay for Sean and I because we just thought, well, we'd do a little bit of... You're robot. back in that room again with the dancers. I am, but <laughs> without having to make an arse of myself. So we just sort of tried to be sort of heavy and a bit alien, you know. Mm. And then it was like, okay, guys, thanks. You know, we've got another one. Hurry. You get a phone call or you don't. Back to basically. busking. I think 
four days later, hey guys, they want you. Bing. And this is both of you? Yep. Yeah. Wow. And six other mimes. Mm. So we go along to Elstree, uh, get fitted for costumes. It's like, okay, Tim, you're tall, you're going to be Two-Face. Great. Mm. Oh. <laughs> 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 Not so great. I actually, actually, you know what? I, <coughs> I think thought. you should show the listening and watching millions. Well, we can pop up a, a picture of this pop character, pop which pop I've got anyway, but this is the action figure uh, <laughs> that uh, Tim portrays. Yeah. Jay Quill, which is actually uh, an assassin working for Lady Valerian, yeah, who's about to kill Jabba the Hutt, but he's, uh, his mission is scuppered when, of course, Luke Han and Chewbacca uh, dispatched Jabba. Well, actually, Princess Leia killed actually, her. Actually, we didn't know any of this. That only came out a lot later. I read it off the back of the card. Oh, you but, uh, we've got I've got our pictures um, to drop in, but... Uh, yeah, so we have to go along for a fitting. So they said, okay, Tim, you're tall. That, that'll work for you. So is he called Toothface then? Is that He what was called Toothface, yeah. yeah but he, I have a, a Lycra bodysuit on, which is never a good look. Um, a padded foam thing on and then this horrible whiffy <laughs> kind of yak fur thing yeah and then they stick someone watch this <laughs> they stick the head on and, and that was a little bit wobbly so they had to take it off and then go away and put more bits in it so that was me and sean uh was <coughs> well he what was he called then what well, he was, I think he was uh, known Yakface, Yakface I think, then. Sure. Yeah, Yakface, is, really. uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, that's one of the most sought-after original figures, actually. Boy, Yakface, you'll get a lot, of, a lot of money. No, it's just luck, because Sean always says, hey, could have been you, could have been me, could have been anyone. Yeah. Was there any kind of, like, daunting <coughs> fear, or just the feeling of, no, God, just I'm two boys in a sweet shop, hello. <laughs> <coughs> um, I imagine you got asked to be in one. I would jizz in my pants. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just an extraordinary thing. So we go home and there was another friend of ours called Graham who was an also um, an alien creature in it. And he used to drive us into Elstree. He had to be there at eight o'clock. So, you know, driving through cold January London, mm. 1982, we both shaved our heads. We got tufts and stuff. We got full makeup on at six o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah. And... We go in and we the costume now fits. We meet the other people. We meet um, the director. We meet the first AD. So Richard Mark one, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And we, then we <coughs> finally go on to set and we think, Jesus. Because normally a film set like Doctor Who, it's cardboard yeah, held wobbly up twiglets things. or something. <coughs> this was the actual <laughs> building. It was, the whole soundstage was absolutely real. There was a ceiling, four walls, a floor. The floor was six foot above the ground. So you had to get up there in your furry trousers. Yeah. Luckily, they didn't put the heads on until they were ready to shoot. But it was um. Well, that's the rancor pit, isn't it? That <coughs> drops you've the got the rancor pit femi, in the middle. Femi Taylor through. And then there is Jabba the Hutt. This massive, twenty foot green slug. So they've not pre, pre uh, kind of like told you anything. You've had to sign secrecy agreements as well, I assume. Yeah, yeah. I've still got the contracts. As you were expressly forbidden to talk about this to Discuss anyone. Discuss anything. We got 300 quid a week each for that, which back in 1982 was quite a lot. I guess yeah. that might be... 1,500 now, maybe, or... I was going to say three grand, actually, but yeah. whatever. Well, maybe, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we, we start filming, and um, there's a lot of people on this set. You know, you've got us creatures. Luckily, Sean and I are sort of lolling around on cushions, not actually having to do anything. Like, <laughs> cool. Uh, watching... A, we're watching a Gamorrean guard tumble down the steps, and then we're watching Leia coming in in, in disguise with the. Mm. As Boosh the bounty hunter. To, yeah. And then we watch poor old Femi Taylor as Ula, the green dancing Who, girl. Who, like Simon Le Bon, looks exactly the same as she did then, it seems. It's, uh, she redid stuff in she, the. I know. Well, I've she met Femi fantastic. several times. It's extraordinary, actually. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but on day one, people are falling over all the time time because if you imagine you've got film lights you know big Klieg lights you've got smoke machines you've got a whole camera crew four camera shoot you've got us yeah thank you I think we got it now <laughs> uh, it, it was terribly terribly uncomfortable very very hot so they thought okay what we do we'll take the heads off in between each take and we'll blow cold air with hair dryers inside these guys necks that's what happened for us. And this went on for about three weeks. What, what kind of hours are you doing? Like 15 hour days? No, no. I mean, it was, a, it was a hurry up and wait job. So you, you do one take. I go, okay, cut. 
So the heads come off, cold air goes in, they reset this. And, and the poor guy who's the Gamorian guard, you know, the pig guard, tumbling down the stairs, it's like take 10. It's like <laughs> 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 and he took his head off, it's like <laughs> um, So we did all that. And then in our off time, we went, we went back to the dressing room and we had a couple of little synthesizers. A little bit of a livener. Tick and top, and, the Star uh, Wars edition. We thought, hey, we could start to write some music, you know play around we, we play horrible tricks tricks on people you know these little plastic cup full of talcum powder on the top of the door <laughs> that sort of shit uh we sean and i uh, to this day are still like two little schoolboys, having the best times of their lives you know and then we moved from jabba's palace to the sail barge and that was even more close to Claustrophobic. Cause they flee you to the US then for that, right? No, no, no. no. That was all else. That was another set. The exteriors were in the desert, but we were on the back lot. Actually, it was the back lot that then became the Big Brother house. <laughs> Day two in the house with yeah. with G Quill the Whippet. Yeah. <laughs> He's upset with Yuck Face. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was that was where Leo strangles Jabba. So that was quite exciting. I never, as a kid, even then, I never really got that because, like, he's a slug. He doesn't have any what? larynx or vertebrae and stuff. She's, I feel, yeah, as a kid, no, I was like, always yeah. hit me in a funny way. He has a face. Jabber. Slugs don't have faces. Yeah, he's, 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 yeah, like exactly. a, he's like a slug well, man, she, obviously. He's, he's a bag. <coughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, that was very, very claustrophobic. Sean had a scene which was later cut out where he has a fight with one of the other characters and knocks him over. And uh, so we do all that, and then they say, "Okay, look, we're going to do. S- we need characters to play Mon Calamari officers." Um, You're like, what is this? Do you want to go over and try on the cosy? It, and it was if the costume fitted, you got the gig. So it fitted. So did any of your mind that you like? Mon comes. Did any of the mind that you kind of like performed in the audition? Did it ever come into play in the actual thing? <laughs> no, there was a lot of stuff that they were going to do. Um, action for us, but there were so many people on the set. They just, they just didn't have it time to deal with not you. Economically Never materialised, kind of, no. yeah. So unfortunately, we did very little in it, you know. But we are sort of regularly seen, if you know I'm what I'm very fine. Like. I know all these faces, like the back yeah. of my hand. I mean, I've like I've been a fan for years and collected all these figures. I even I have this figure somewhere in storage, as I said before the show started, but I couldn't find it, so I <laughs> re-bought it for the show. Mm. So anyway, the Mon Cal stuff was great. We're on Ad- Admiral Akbar's ship. Mm. It's a trap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of sort of flappy, sort of panicky acting, all sitting at keyboards pretending to type. And these, these were very, big, very long hands, haven't you, with that big lobster-like appendage yeah, on it? Yeah, it's funny. Man. Oh, hello. Maybe you can show them that one. <laughs> Which is, here he is, yes, as the yes. Uh, Mon Neil Calamari Neil officer. Yeah. Probably yeah. the most, apart from Jabra, I think, the most, <coughs> uh, I guess, iconic faces in the film, really. The, the, like, the fish creatures are there, <coughs> the, the Mon Calamari. Yeah, um, I think we were actually, no, we were still ha- having to look out of our own nostrils for that. Yeah. Really? Yeah, and same with Jay Quill, I'm looking out well, of my, yeah, my nose. Is there any uh, animatronics or just an Admiral Atbar and you just had a mask on? Or? Um, it's not actually Tim Rose doing the dialogue, but mm. he, he's doing all the, the actual movements and stuff. I think. Mm. Have you got servos and things in your head there going, just, just, no? No, I've got nothing at all. Just to, I mean, leap forward in time now. When mm. does the, the kind of y- you being known as Tim Dry from this and yeah. as the Whippet and yeah. the, the, the fan reaction and things, and you start this kind of like weird convention life oh, as well, okay. don't you, of sorts? Um, so after January 82, I go off and do Extro, this horrible sci-fi horror movie, which makes, you know, Killer Tomatoes look like <laughs> Harold Pinter. You d- well, you say that, but like, uh, well, for those that don't know, I actually rented Extro. Oh, here we go. Show here me we that. go with Extro. Don't tell your story. Which at at really it hit me as a kid. Like, it was such a, an extraordinary uh, performance, if it, and the costume as well. I couldn't figure it out for a long time. And it scared the bejesus out of me. It's uh, yeah. It's probably because th- it wasn't probably because it wasn't aimed at eight-year-olds. No, well, <laughs> no, cause, uh, basically, my. Uh, yeah. brother was going out with this girl his dad owned a video store so I kind of went in regularly go oh, I'm Nigel's brother can I have some videos and I'd pick anything I wanted <laughs> I got on. Texas Chainsaw Massacre it, 
It's oh. uh, but this is just uh, this explains a lot. I think it does, doesn't it? Wow. I think the imagination on showing it and the bizarreness <laughs> of it just puts it in like the top horror pantheon for yeah. me. Possibly more than Return of the Jedi. I actually love this film, Tim. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic. Oh, that's sweet. I mean, it, again, that was a funny thing. Sean and I were doing twice weekly cabaret at a, a wine bar, Coconut Grove. It's a cocktail bar, actually. And we do our robot act upstairs and downstairs, you know. Mm. And that used to frighten people. I remember some, there was a party of sort of, I don't know, all sort of Sloney types. And um, the woman said, oh my God, they're horrible. And she ran off towards the toilet, <laughs> so I followed her. <laughs> and the husband came up and said, oi, that's my wife. So I said, sorry, I thought that was your mother. <laughs> Carried on with my act. <laughs> Very nearly got beaten to death. But we're doing it one night and this guy comes up and says, hey, come and join us for a drinky, you know. I'm with a few friends. Um, we're, doing, we're putting together this horror movie, sci-fi movie. It's called The Reaper. Oh, interesting. We'd love what you guys do. We'd like you to play two parts in it. Uh, you think, Sean, you'd be great as the alien. Tim, there's a scene where this action man comes to life. Yeah, it's an iconic moment in the movie as uh, well. So I say, great, you know, and Sean goes, great. And there was something to do with Chrysalis Records. I think they were getting some money from that. So mm. we have more meetings with them. They're all a bit, you know, Chelsea boys. <laughs> and um, I said, hey, wouldn't it be great if instead of a vertical guy in a rubber suit, maybe he's on all fours no on all fours but going backwards oh, so that was your idea mm. yeah oh wow, well go, done. wow that's <laughs> great Tim that's what makes it uh, what it is for me yeah. I just think it's but so then freaky they say it. actually Tim we want you to play the alien and Sean to play the action man oh bollocks <laughs> uh, so I'm now committed to my own grave. horrible <laughs> <laughs> thing I, I tell you what I had to have my whole body cast in that crab position oh wow yeah and I don't you um, crawl forward. You crawl. You're crawling. Are you crawl, You're not actually crawling like that. Though. You're ruining the movie magic. He's the I'm one going facing like this. upwards. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. Yes, I'm not like that. That's him looking no, 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 that way. Okay, impossible. Yeah, but it had to be back cast. of his head. I mean, when you look at the picture now, it's actually pretty obvious. But I couldn't work it out for years. In the context of a, of a <laughs> movie, because you never see me very clearly. Yeah. You think what is that? Mm -hmm. But having your whole body cast is a bit like having a Brazilian. Yes. Because there's always bits. Lots of Vaseline. Stuck in there. <laughs> yeah, but there's always a few strays. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sort of make a seam down the side. So you're actually, it's like a carapace. You're, you're in two mm. halves. And then they do your whole head cast. And that's very disturbing. Mm. It's claustrophobic, just I imagine, two, right? You two straws. Yeah. Think, oh, yeah, I remember this. Do they ever just leave <laughs> well, you in that position, <laughs> just stuck, frozen? No, what they do, they say, OK, Tim, we're just going for lunch now. <laughs> we'll be back in about an hour or so. <laughs> but the thing about the stuff it goes it goes off very quickly it gets very hot mm. and then it gets very hard and it got to try and get it off you know so it's all of a sudden I'm all my scenes are filmed in the woods in Buckinghamshire in March and the thing about a rubber suit a very tight fitting rubber suit if you're hot you get really hot mm. if you're cold you get really cold and I'm thinking god damn it you know two months ago I'm in Elstree being treated like a a king, an alien D list king. actor. Yeah. <laughs> and Sean got a flight. He, he'd turn up as I'm going home, because all my stuff was at night. He'd turn up at 10 o'clock in the morning with a set of golf clubs. I said, What are you doing? He said, Well, I've got some time off. You know, you don't need me till the afternoon. <laughs> Getting paid either way. I'm action man. <laughs> Bastard. But his scene was brilliant, actually. It is. It's, it's it is uh, really there are I so thought many, that like, was disconcerting. Much like more frightening than my stuff. You said it was called Reaper as well. Is, was it changed to Extra? Yeah, but suddenly it became Extra. Uh, really? Okay, whatever. Did the script change then? Or? But to my joy, um, I said, okay, now there's a scene where you murder this guy and his girlfriend in the woods. And they, they get out of the car. Said, okay, I can handle that. But don't forget, I'm, everything's backwards, so mm. my head's on backwards. I can, I can only see you where I've been. Mm. And uh, to my joy, I discover it was Robert Perino who was the guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is for I shock. <laughs> payback. <laughs> you... <laughs> no, I How did he end it. up in the film then? It seems oh, like there's a weird because of shock. You've got Barbie Wilde, of course. He was went into Hellraiser as the female Cenobite. Well, that was kind of like about 
four or five years later. The threads of horror lineage you kind of created. That's I know, the, it's very weird. I knew your name years ago because I was so impressed with Extra as a kid. I was like, <laughs> that was a person? Who, Tim Dry? Yeah. That's a Tim Dry? I was like, yeah, I bet I can't wait to interview him one day. Well, yeah, well, here I'm you are, up. I know. So excited. I'm um, actually like a ex anyway. excited so, boy. Yes, I get to kill Robert and I get to kill his girlfriend. <laughs> and then I sort of break into this uh, country cottage and... Um, this sort of ex-page three girl called Susie plays this sort of but why she's on her own with a dog in a cottage in the middle of nowhere I don't know <laughs> wearing a dressing gown yeah but she disobeys rule number one of any horror movie uh, do not open the door at night if you hear a strange sound and you're on your own but she does that she opens the door dog runs out oh no Sparky come back what is it din dins and obviously I'm out there <sighs> lurking you know and the dog thinks, he runs back in. She goes, good boy, good boy. Shuts the door, but by then I've already made my way in you somehow. In. Just like that. Anyway, so rule number two, don't turn all the lights off. <laughs> but she does that. She turns all the lights off. She takes a shotgun down from above the fireplace and <coughs> is sort of patrolling the living room. And then With the lights whoosh, off, yeah. It's it's hello, why? It's, it's very irrational, really, isn't it? It's well, a scream hadn't happened, so like, I guess horror movies. Because according uh, to all horror films, you uh, know, yeah. bad guys the and aliens and evil weren't things in place are scared yet. of the light. <laughs> but they're still doing it. What was it I saw the other week? Uh, was it Insidious or the other oh, one? Oh, okay. But Ethan it's Insidious. Hawk, you know, he's got a baseball bat and yeah. he's got the lights off. He's like, yeah. what is wrong with yeah, you? Haven't yeah, you yeah. learnt from extra? <laughs> anyway, I trip her up and then I jump on top of her and I stick my appendage down her throat, <laughs> which is a very subtle <laughs> phallic symbolism there. But because I can't see what I'm doing because my head's on backwards. So I'm raping a woman. <laughs> she's going, no, 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 no. Anyway, uh, cut to a couple of other bits of business with the boy and stuff and then it's back to the cottage and uh, there's a sort of mound of stuff in the corner which is me and now I'm now being eaten by the dog <laughs> okay <laughs> and she's sort of staggering around with her belly getting bigger again. so oh, gross oh, oh. and you hear this sort of <laughs> noise coming from her stomach and she's sort of leaning over the sink and then she falls back and then suddenly the belly's huge the thighs bigger and bigger and bigger and then you hear this sort of <laughs> and out comes a man's <laughs> head from between her thighs <laughs> and oh, it's a one shoulder out two shoulders out he's climbing out and you think that is pretty intense because yeah. there's afterbirth oh it's super stuff. intense even now it's kind <laughs> of uh, but it's the noises it's like yeah. oh no a great scene anyway he climbs out fence. completely he's got he bites his own umbilical cord because she's dead I yeah, she's, yeah she died well, you know, she's, had she's a got well. a slight no. flu yes yeah, she's dead um <laughs> and then it goes on from there it's like okay is it, but there's so many like surreal moments in it as well i mean of course oh it's all there's the action I mean, man scene which is great and stuff there's a it's there's, it's very disjointed but yeah. there's so many like great it's bad i i just recently wrote a i think it was a 5,000 word review of it for this Film Rage magazine which is coming out end of the year and I said you know now this film is actually really quite good because it's so insane it's so it is. stoned yeah. all of a sudden there's a Black Panther patrolling the sort of corridors in this <laughs> flat for no reason there's a, there's a the horrible clown. dwarf yeah. clown with full makeup um <laughs> There's that weird thing at the end with black face and teeth and stuff. Oh, that's, that that's, that's his father. the dad, and yeah, he's reverting back. But then there's alien eggs, you know, and... Mir well, Mary, Mary Darbo, Darbo gives uh, birth to these, like, w black water balloons in a bath with this thing. Oh, God, it's... I'm <laughs> making all the noise I'm describing. Oh, it's, uh, wow, it's, quite, it's very intense. It's really so much. Check it out. <laughs> it's, it's a horror favourite of mine. Anyway, okay, so... Moving right along, let's flash forward from 1982 to 2011, I think. What happened? Well, in the, between well, those times, you were like one of the one of the iconic faces of adverts. Well, I was looking yeah. at your YouTube page, and I implore other people that are listening or watching to do this. Uh, Tim has done a raft of adverts. There's the one with the tap on the nose. I remember that. Yeah, that was. There's the one with Toby Jones in. I remember that. Sherman ones. Uh, there's the old car commercial where you're kind of the devil. Oh, Ford Fiesta. Yeah. I met my wife on that one. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so no, that's got you into acting, I guess, then. Well, no, more. I've been sort of acting little bits before, but 
I had a choice. Do I make lots of money doing adverts or do I do fringe plays above a room in, above a pub in Camden? You, know? you made the right choice. Yeah, I did both actually. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it, that was great, great fun actually. But I was never going to be taken seriously as an actor. I didn't go to drama school. I didn't do rep. Right. And I, I don't know. There's something about a 30 second commercial with a huge budget is so much more exciting than mm. doing Pinto or something. Yeah. But also, as you say, you know, if you if you get the money in a huge, you know, if you, you get paid so much more for doing that, oh, then yes. you can do things like the little plays and the fringe. Well, and stuff I did. Because I you did. don't need to, you're not struggling so much. No, anymore. that's right. This is I did, with my cleaning, I ex-wife, I did put on a version of ha- uh, Stephen Burkhoff's Harry's Christmas, which is a one-man play, yeah. uh, which is a challenge. Is that how you popped up on his radar to appear in uh, Decadence, wasn't it? Um, possibly, yeah. He he didn't come and see it, but his his girlfriend did, and she she raved about it. Yeah. <coughs> um, I went to audition for Decadence with lots of other people, and um, I just did a, an obscenely over the top Sloan Ranger type. Oh, darling. That's well, he so loves that kind of stuff, doesn't he? And groovy. That's kind of his M.O. Burkhoff. Or I did a, a well-tasted geezer, you know. Really like geezer. Right? <coughs> anyway, um, mm. yeah, so lots of other stuff in the meantime. But suddenly, Sean phones up. It's 2012. He says, do you want to... I've just been contacted by email from this guy. He said, do you want to make a few quid signing pictures? I said, what do you mean, signing pictures? He goes, well, pictures of us in Star Wars. What do you mean, pictures so of us in So this is only recent. Wars? Well, it, even that's 12 years ago, isn't it? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, in terms of, well, as I said before, just when I said flash forward, like how this convention thing where you pop up now as Tim Dry. Yeah, well, I'm uh, getting Or, or as extra at the horror conventions or... So I say, what do you mean, pictures of us? He goes, well, apparently this guy has got lots of pictures of our characters. You blackmailing me? What are you doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got pictures. You were looking. Um, posters and stuff. So we meet this guy and his partner in a bar in Notting Hill and he's got a rucksack full of stuff. He's got pictures like this, he's got posters, Jedi posters. And he said, look, I'll pay you X amount per shot. You know, so we ended up with 80 quid each. I thought, wow, this is cool. Mm. What, how did this happen? He said, well, you've actually got a character name now and you've got a whole backstory. Mm-hmm. Because I haven't had any involvement with Star Wars since 1982. Yeah. I got on with the rest of my life. You know, it was a job. A good job, but it was just a job, you know. And um, he said, they, they, "There's these things called autograph conventions, um, where they pay people like yourself to come <laughs> along and sign pictures and make money." And I said, Are you joking? He said, "No, there's a guy called <laughs> Blah Blah who runs a show in Basildon. He's doing one next April. I'll give you his email address." So I contact him. He goes, "Yeah, yeah come along." You and Sean, I'll pay you 200 quid each. You know, print out your own pictures. And there we are. We're there with Jeremy Bullock and, you know, who's Boba Boba Fett. Fett, yeah. I want to get him on And a few point. others. And uh, I thought, this is money for old rope, isn't it? And suddenly you're plugged in. Some, some guy says, oh, yeah, I've just come back from Japan. We're thinking, ding, mm-hmm. want to go. Uh, others say, yes, I've just done Germany. And, and, oh, Spain. It's like, fucking hell. So we're in there suddenly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's and word of mouth it's like oh these guys are up for it now because they were the new kids on the block Jeremy yeah. and all the, you know the biggies they've been like doing it for years Dave yeah, Prowls yeah. and Boy Am Your Father they've been doing it since you know the get go really but we didn't know anything about it this uh, Robert Watts said it was like he fell asleep for 20 years and the sort of mushrooms grew up of Star Wars conventions it's strange well he's uh, Jeremy's brother isn't he Jeremy Bullock I think yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. I love Robert Watts he's very uh, outspoken he's and he's interesting he's a good friend we've had so many <coughs> well, whenever uh, I see him on like evenings together. DVDs and things he's, he's, he's awesome he's very outspoken and like sharp and with it and he calls a spade a spade and things he's a very cool guy he, yeah. he left the film business to embark upon a shamanistic journey ayahuasca and all that yes oh really oh, yeah. oh wow amazing oh definitely yeah no mm-hmm. awesome. boy Anyway, so that's how it started. And how are they to deal with these people that come to you for autographs? Uh, Sorry, what? How are, how are they to deal with sometimes the people what, the, that come the, to you for autographs? The actual are they, fans. Are they too, too much sometimes? They're like, yeah. they expect you to know everything about your character. You're like, what? Or Yeah, but we do now. Yeah. But no, what, what always gets me is that 
is how nervous these people are. Because you always have to do a picture with them. You put your arm around and they're actually shaking. Oh. Oh, God, that's so oh. weird. And you're sit sitting at a table like this. You've got your piles of picks, your Sharpies and whatever. Yeah. And they come up and they're obviously a bit nervous. They're a bit starstruck. They don't know what <laughs> to say. And they sort of stand there and, and they say, um, was it hot in the costume? <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's all the, great the things question. they could say. <laughs> it's like taxi drivers when you try to make small talk. You're like, so you've been on the shift a long time, and all <laughs> the standard things you ask. Yeah. So you say yes, gosh, it was, you know, and you have to go into the whole spiel about yes, I've got three layers on and the lights and the hair. So you've got like three standard rack Ontario bits you yep. do for each. Yeah. And th there is one guy who we've seen several times in England. Uh, he never says anything. He just he's got a very strange body posture. He sort of stands like this. And looks at all the pictures. Is it Larry Grayson? <laughs> well, no, he's not camp. He's just sort of slightly odd. And um, <laughs> he's trying to figure out who's who. And then he, he, <laughs> he'll say, Is that you in the costume? <laughs> and he's got that sort of voice. It goes up and down in yeah. a very odd cadence. Car horn voice. And he just stands there. And so you go, Yes, it is. Thank you. And then he go off and you hear him doing the same thing all the way around the hall to everyone else. So, so what happens now, Sean and I do the old, uh, oh, he's coming, it's that guy. Well, I'm <laughs> Is he gone yet? <laughs> Horrible. But, I mean, I'm wanted in the basement. Goodbye. It's very funny. I mean, it's... Um, I mean, is he I don't know, a film conspiracy theorist? Is he? Well, I don't know. He's like... <laughs> I don't know. He really it's believes these aren't really you. You... Um, <laughs> I think for some of these people, it is their entire life. Yeah. There's one guy who said, yeah, I've spent 70,000 quid on oh, Star Wars stuff. I and his to, wife to behind it. him is going, uh -huh. <laughs> Tell me about this. There's an entire there room in the, the house devoted to it. <laughs> there goes the, Swimming pool. the villa in Spain. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, hey, I'd rather they did this than, you know, beat up people at football matches. Do you think people are getting, like, yeah. shitty with you at conventions or for any Sorry? reason? Or off-colour off people or just... People with like shitty, people. shitty attitudes or like dumb questions no. or no? Okay. No. A lot of very bad body odour. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe it's, it's nerves or something. <laughs> you know, but it's just like, whoa, okay. Well, do you get more like, do you do like separate, I guess, horror conventions with extra or do you do like... I've only ever done one horror convention and that was in, in Indianapolis. Mm. That was on the back of extra. I think I've seen your picture with Barbie at one of those, right? Is that what? Oh, Barbie does a lot because of Hellraiser, but I get flown out to Indianapolis um, and I've got all my extra pictures. I've got sort of five or six different ones. And I brought a few Star Wars pictures out. I, don't, I sell about two of those and everyone goes, oh my God, you were in Star Wars. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. But it was very weird. There was um, Tom Sizemore, the sort of, Ex uh, disgraced, porn disgraced making porn actor who was in all these actor. amazing films like Heat and then uh, <laughs> Jake Boosie, all these people, you know, guy who was um, the original Mike Myers in Halloween, and and all these people are walking around. They're all dressed up as you know Leatherface or Pinhead or something. Nick Castle, that's him. He and I hear this woman saying, "Dwayne, be careful with the chainsaw." <laughs> and I look round and there's this this little. Five-year-old has got a sort of blood-soaked apron and is sort of wielding a sort of See, that was me. <laughs> that was me. I think, right, how are you going to grow up? <laughs> You'll be but a podcaster. No, it was weird, but I, I must tell you there was a very funny moment happened there that on the last night, I'm having... They have a sort of party for all the guests, you know, and the mugs can pay and mingle, you know. And I met this guy called John L. Tenney, and he, he writes about strange phenomena. He's, he's very well known you know he's a big fan of um, 14 times all that sort of strange events and occurrences mm. so we're saying should we go outside and drink some wine you know yeah because it's horrible cheap red wine but it, we couldn't stay in the room with all these not like the amazing stuff we've got for this show <laughs> <laughs> the bo boys you know so we're sitting outside i was still smoking in those days so i'm having a, a well-earned oily and um all of a sudden this massive thunderstorm appears out of nowhere where the sky goes jet black and Trees are going like this, and mm. bins are rolling around. And we, did you see? You know, because we just sat there, sort of jollily, and then all of a sudden it's gone. That's weird. Well, we're in the Midwest, okay. And then there's a long drive coming from the hotel down to the main road, and we see this sort of red 
thing getting closer and closer and it gets closer and it's a stretch limo it's bright red and it pulls up right in front of us at the entrance of the hotel the back door opens and uh, these two sort of bimbos in red mini dresses get out <laughs> followed by Santa Claus in full outfit. <laughs> And they're all giggling, and they go into the hotel and disappear. But it's only June. <laughs> Pimp Santa. Oh my so God. John and I are going, did, did we just actually see them? <laughs> but that was my horror convention. It's probably escape yeah. Mrs. Claus for a night, so then he's going to get back just to the North Pole. I don't know. No, it's, it's very weird. I, I get tired of it sometimes, mm. because it's like I have other things in my life. Mm which we're going to move on to fairly shortly. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of people, uh, I can't mention any names, obviously, but that moment in Jedi or Empire or whatever is crystallizing. the moment. moment. Yeah. Everything else is nothing. I think that's a bit odd. Um, Jeremy Bullock is, a, is an absolute sweetheart, but he does so many shows. There's a website called Star Wars Actors Appearances, like Tim Dry, you know, Burnley. <laughs> And I am end, doing that Legoland in Bavaria next ooh, in two weeks' time. Please tell me it's extra. No. <laughs> Lego. Lego extra kit. Star Wars scenes and characters. Yeah. And they pay people like me to go out there. Um, but Jeremy he, he's all over the world, literally. Mm. You know, April, Mexico, Vancouver. Well, he's had, he had little parts in I think, the prequels as well, doesn't he? So he's as, as himself, he appeared... Uh, but uh, uh, it must be quite yeah, stressful just going all the time to... No, but think of the air miles. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, he always takes Maureen's wife with him because he gets a billion air miles every year. You know? Right, that's true. But he's a sweetheart. He, Robert Watts phoned him up and said, look, they're casting this um, second Star Wars movie. Why don't you go down? And Jeremy said, oh, I'm an actor, you know. Because he was in Summer Holiday, of course. Mm. Mm. He's also in... Uh, the, what is it? The Spy You Love Me with James, James Bond. He's on the yes, Polaris sub at the start. For that, but he'd done a lot. He did Robin Hood and TV series. Anyway, he goes along, and they said, "Well, look, try the costume on." And it fitted. They said, "Well, you, you are got the Boba Fett." And then they ruined it with those Australian accents. Mm. But he's made an yeah. absolute the remix. remix. You know. Dave Prowse as well. I mean, he. If there's an envelope opening anywhere, <laughs> Dave is there. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a sweetheart. You know, he's in bad shape. That um, little Kenny Baker as well. How oh. he's going to fit into the new there. C-3PO. I, I, he was in a wheelchair in Burnley the other week. Well, who is it? Peter Mayhew as Chewbacca has had awful problems with his legs. He's and he's both knees replaced. Yeah, oh. but he's now playing Chewbacca in the new films. I, to I some wonder degree. if someone said, oh, I think it's just a token thing mm. that it might be someone else, but they will uh. be seen to be part of it. Right, yeah. Yeah. He does a very distinct walk that you can tell it's him, I think. His knees nerve. sort of knock together. Or yeah. did. I don't know. Buggy. The new ones might. They've been sort of beefy. Well, well, we hope <laughs> you're okay, Peter, and soldier on, sir. Yeah. No, it's a very strange thing. I mean, it has taken me to Tokyo and America yeah. and Germany, France. Have you got any book this year? Have you got more? I'm doing Legoland in Bavaria in two weeks. I'm doing Birmingham in November. I'm doing Denmark in November. I'm doing Olympia in July. Because we, we we thought to do that because we July missed it this one. year to go yeah, to a convention in London I was Film and Comic Con. Yeah, people, the, the yeah. Comic Con in July. I was probably yeah. going to go to maybe you know cosplay a bit. What yeah. would you cosplay as? Oh, I'm not really. I haven't really decided yet. What, what would you? You not sort of um, yes. What poison would you? ivy or something? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I love anime. So <laughs> go as I, trip to the moon. That's not very um recognizable here. Goes trip to the moon, can of beans, cut it in half, or stick <laughs> it on your eye, put some yeah, potato yeah, on your face. You. Come on. Sweet, <coughs> thanks. As, as, as that's another thing, the cosplay thing. It's, um, I had no knowledge of that. Yeah. And we were booked to do a show in Dallas a few years back, and it was a terrible journey, but you finally get there, and, and it's all cosplayers. Yeah. There's three stars. In America, people. it's huge. People it's put so Dallas. much effort into it. I didn't even get to see the grassy knoll or anything. <laughs> but... I don't know who any of these people are. Yeah. But it's huge. It's big, yeah. big, big stuff. So wait, what are the projects that are sort of closer to your heart then? At well, the your book is one, I guess, isn't writing. it? Writing. That was yeah. 2005, right? Which? That falling upward. Which your book, actually. <coughs> oh, that. Oh, this. Oh, but this is the update, which I did last year. 
So there's another 20,000 words and more pictures. Well, when I was actually buying this on Amazon, uh, one of the prices were 195 That's, pounds. I don't know. What, what was that? <laughs> it originally came out well, in 2005 by a publisher who then went bust. Mm. Um, maybe somebody bought some copies. But, I mean, that's insane. I don't know how that works. For anyone listening as an author, how, was it, how difficult was it to get the book up and out? Because I imagine you've got a... This one or the first one? The first one was a print-on-demand. Right. Which was a, 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 a woman who has no name who set up her own POD company. And then mm. you paid 80 quid or something and she'd get your book out. Yeah. Uh, she then went bust. She was done for fraud and stuff. Um, then I was approached... This is a strange little tie-up. Well, that's uh, your answer to the question, isn't it? She's the one selling the books for £195. To well, yeah, yeah no one's going to buy it, aren't they? <laughs> you know. Um, actually, about a year and a half ago, I was running a film club with Robert Carino at, at the Soho Sanctum Hotel. Oh, well, that was yeah. the extra night. I was going to come to that, but I was in America Should for pilot season. Barbie Wilde, I read yeah. from Venus Complex, her fantastic novel, and we had five-sixths of shock in the same place for the first time in 30 yeah. years. Wow. Anyway, I was doing one night there, and this little guy comes up to me. Little guy, sorry. Sorry, Paul. Um, guy comes up to me, clutching a book, and says, Hey, Tim, um, I owe you a favor. I said, well, I don't owe you. He said, well, I, when I was 14, I went to every gig on the Warriors tour. And you were doing a gig with Gary somewhere up north. Yeah, it's the Gary Newman Mad Max looking yeah. thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He said, I... I was only 14, I didn't have anywhere to stay. So I um, slept in a lady's toilet. Oh. And halfway through the night, the police found me and arrested me. And I gave them your name. <laughs> 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 I said, you bastard. Well, I never heard anything from the police, so obviously they weren't that impressed. But <laughs> he said, I, I feel I owe you something for that. And I, I now publish my own books. I want to republish Falling Upwards. Oh, awesome. So I said, yes, absolutely. He said, it'd be a 50-50 split, mm. no advance, but, you know. Um, so I did. He said, can you update it? So I thought, oh, God, what's happened in the last sort of eight years? <laughs> oh, yeah, stuff happened. Yeah. You know. so How long did it take to write the, f the yeah, initial so first draft to get the book out? You have, like, first draft? Well, when the first book came out, you had to, um, like, how was it writing for the first it time? It started a long time before that. It started in 1987. No, it didn't. It started in 1997. I was going to write a book called Ha Ha Ha, I Get Paid For It, which was uh, my riposte to people back in the 80s when they'd say, cool, you look a bit weird. i say, yeah, but I get paid for it. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Rusty always had a great one. If he was walking past a building site and people would go, oi, wake up. He'd go, yeah, well, you keep laying bricks, I'll keep laying chicks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Anyway, so I was going to write a, a book or bookette about um, the advertising business, what it's like. Uh, so I did it, and I thought, that's not really a book, is it? <laughs> it's a chapter. And someone mm. said, well, why don't you write your autobiography? I said, my life is boring. What can I write about? <laughs> I said, well, so modest. Tick and top. Yeah. And you start to think, actually, I have there done tales. quite a lot. There are stories, yeah. But then you think, oh, I've got to go back to day one, you know. So the original falling upwards I didn't do it in a chronological order okay I jumped backwards and forwards in time in the same way that I'm doing now I'm talking about one thing no, I'm that's thinking fine. about 1980 did you have a book editor for the first run then or no, no. I just left to myself and Pour she up. just literally printed it on demand but it, it was originally going to start after I am dead because uh, I wake up in the afterlife which is like an art deco movie theatre with all my favourite objects around me. And there's a big screen. And uh, there's a strange man whose face I can never see because he's always got the light behind him. Right. But he's going to show me the movie of my life. And I say, is it all right if we pause at certain points and can we skip the bad bits? He goes, sure, we can do whatever you want. And then it cuts straight into me in bed with Jane Collins. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dream sequence, I hasten to write, unfortunately. Uh, and then it was sort of pointed out that maybe it's not a good idea to start your autobiography Shagging as a dead Collins. person. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Okay. It's a, it's, yeah, dead, but dead person, yeah. it's like, mm, a bit too weird. But this one, Paul, the publisher on this one, said, I want you to make it chronological. I'll do that for you, actually. You just write it. 
Okay. I'll make it chronological. I'm getting sticky. Oh, so he was essentially your editor of sorts then, or kind of... Yeah, poor bugger. He had to put it all together. But writing another 20,000 words, that was great. But um, I find now that writing is something that I really enjoy. Mm. So I don't have to do it with anyone else. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I don't want to make music anymore. Uh, although I shouldn't say never, you know, but... Well, you I've just released it. a single, haven't you, like, the last couple of years? <laughs> no, I did a... Or um, CD. Oh, well, look. <coughs> that came Shameless out. plug. Shameless the plug of shame. As Dream made. Orphans. That was the last Tick and Talk album. We came mm. back together after 22 years. And that was all done at home. I'm very pleased with that. It's a soundtrack album. Um, and then I started working by accident through uh, Facebook, actually, with a, a guitarist I used to know in the 80s called Mo Blackford. Mm. who's was Becky Bondage's guitarist. And I was going out with her. And I met him. And he was suddenly in London. And he said, I haven't seen you for 18 years. Do you want coffee? I said, sure. We had a coffee, and as we were leaving, I said, I don't suppose you'd fancy doing some music together. Mm. Why did I say that? He said, God, I thought you'd never ask. Oh, awesome. And we, we came back to my place, and we started working on a track. And we did a, a whole track in two days called Somewhere. I wrote the lyrics for it overnight. And we did nine songs all together, and I thought, wow, I'm doing music again. I thought I'd done that. But this was acoustic Brazilian guitar meets sort of subtle electronica. Oh, with with me writing the lyrics and singing. Can we um? Yes. Can we move a track in? If we can we so segue that into this Hello. And around? Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. <coughs> God, blimey, go. Cool. <laughs> it's all on me pod. Yeah. Um. So we did that for a while, and a couple of years later, we did a few gigs in London. We did the Troubadour, which was great. We did uh, the Bedford in Balham. Do you know that place? No. Beautiful venue. It used to be a hotel, and then it became a brothel in the 1800s. It's a huge sort of grand Victorian building. And they have a like a circular Shakespearean theatre. So it's, it's oh, theatre yeah. in the round. Mm. That's fun. And they have a lot of acoustic gigs on there. Huh. That's where I filmed Son of <coughs> Nosferatu as well. That's oh another yes, Son story. of Nosferatu. Oh God, it's your best end, film. is it? <sighs> See, the funny thing about my life is that you do something, you think, right, I've done that. Now what? I've never had a plan, a master plan. I never, mm. I w at school, people say, what do you want to do when you grow up, Tim? I, just, I said, I want to be taller. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I never, I never wanted to be a fireman or a gymnast or a male prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> Photographer? No, never thought about that at all. So we haven't, we haven't touched on that, though, at all. No, we haven't, have we? Uh, it's yeah, interesting you famously because photographed I Mick Jagger, right? Yes. Oh God, it doesn't end, does it? Um, <laughs> if my your life, college, darling. If my art <laughs> college had had a photographic course, I would definitely have done it. Mm. But it didn't. Malcolm McLaren went to Rygate School of Art for two weeks, and he went to Croydon Art School for two weeks. And what he'd do, he'd, he'd sign up, get the grant, and then bugger off two weeks later. <laughs> that was clever. Um, photography, I discovered through a, an old friend of mine who said, "Hey, I've just bought this." Pentax camera, it's a bit posh, you know, so I had a go with it. I thought, oh, I like that. Mm. So I, I was making a lot of money doing commercials, so I bought everything. I always overdo everything, you know. So instead of having one camera, I've got to have three, haven't I? <laughs> and I've got to have the lights, I've got to have the backdrop, I've got to have the filters, different lenses, and the kit, and the case, and the leather jacket, and the attitude, and all that. And I thought, wow, I'm really good at this, uh, up to a point. Technically, I'm not good, but I have good, a good eye mm. for stuff. And then I discovered that I could fuck up a picture. I could make it look like a painting by hand. Mm. This is way before Photoshop. Yes, yeah, it's a chemical process. And one of Barbie's friends is, is a lady, which is an ironic name for Mick Jagger's personal assistant, Janice Crotch. Um, <laughs> go there if you want to, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't. Like Sweet gift. <laughs> she was actually Richard James Burgess's PR first off. That's how we met. And she was then PRing for Mick, you know, and Barbie was acting in a fringe play that Janice's boyfriend had written. And I laughingly said, hey, I'd love to photograph Mick sometime. And she said, well, what are you doing next week? It's like, ding, another one of those oh <laughs> moments, you know. I said, oh, fuck, now I've got to put my... I've camera, actually got to do my it. lens where my mouth is, yeah. So she said, yeah, he's doing a promo for his new single, solo single. She 
you want to do it? I said, yeah. So there's no money in it, but, you know. Yeah, mix a short of a bob or two. What am I going to wear? Pay you. <laughs> I spent the night before thinking, what do I wear? White jeans, that'd be good. That's cool. No, but we're in a dis- disused gas works. Could be mucky. Um, what about a jacket? Could get cold. <laughs> Check all the cameras again, and, and like OCD, it's like. Was it just I, you I and him, or did you have a team of people helping? No you? team. <laughs> he had a team. It was just me and a case with two cameras in it. Thinking, please don't let me fuck it up. Yeah, don't yeah. let me. Tr- and how no, was he? Was he cold? charge oh. them or something? Yeah. Didn't take the lens cap off. Yeah, Sorry, mate. Yeah. Was he alright with you? Was he? Did he trust you? Or? He was very funny because there was a little stage. Great deserted gas works. It's amazing. It's been used in. Um, oh. Full metal jacket. Mm. Uh, it's the one in the Docklands, isn't it? They yes. in Vietnam for, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's always been in something. City of Men, maybe. Anyway, and um, so there's a little stage in this sort of ruined bit, and um, I think, well, I'm not using a tripod, I'm using fast film, it'll be fine. I've got both cameras, they're both working, everything's cool. I am wearing the white jeans and a leather jacket, so I'm cool. And then I see these two sort of burly types leading out this sort of old man in a fright wig. I think, that's weird, what the fuck's that? I think, oh my God, it's him. He was only 50 then, this is 1993. Mm. And he's like this, he's very sort of, hello. No, he wasn't, was it hot in the costume? <laughs> <laughs> was it hot in your camera? <laughs> um, and he, he's, his head looks huge and he's got really short legs. And I thought, that's very odd. They're very tiny, aren't they, the stones? Mm. I've met them all but Mick and they're tiny, tiny men. Yeah, big head, Yeah. short, short legs. Which actually looks great on camera. Anyway, he gets on the stage and he's, you know, he's waiting. And uh, <laughs> he's the, the voice so I couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah, all right. the, the fold back starts. And all of a sudden, you know, he's become Mick Jagger. I think, wow, now that is what I've heard about Marilyn. Mm. She could go into a supermarket with a scarf on and no one notices her. Yeah, then the real Marilyn, not Mick Jagger. say, fuck it. I want to be. No, don't sing. Let's buy a <laughs> tin of beans, Marilyn. And he, he suddenly became this extraordinary figure who I'd been worshipping since I was 12 years old. I mm. saw the stones four times. Mm. Wow. So I do shots, please, please, please. Looking good, looking good. Won't know until I get home. Oh, God. Anyway, there's a break and I go up and I say, hi, Mick, I'm your photographer, Tim. He goes, yeah, I saw your book. And I th- Hello, Tim. Yeah. Oh, do you know what I do? <laughs> home, me. He had a slightly sort of damp Weak oh. handshake. Oh, I hate that. Disappointing. That is disappointing. <laughs> I really hate weak handshakes. Mm. Saves it for the ladies. I, th- I feel like. But he yeah. said, "Yeah, yeah, I like it." You know, and then we did different setups, and I thought, "Oh, all the things I could say to him." <laughs> what was it like shagging Wait, Pay me. Pay no, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> you were in, you were in the position. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't do that. But uh, I didn't process the films myself I took him into a place in uh, Poland Street yeah it's not worth the risk if you fucked up the negative yeah the world's most embarrassing thing they're all fine actually great Mm. very grainy very black and white Mm. is there anywhere we can find them so we can perhaps pop them up as we're chatting I've got five on my Facebook page oh awesome okay under Mick Picks or something yeah okay I gave I stupidly gave all the negs to Janice at the record company which is wrong (laughs) because I own those. Yeah. And she said, oh, great. Well, she, he'll like that one. He won't like that because his neck looks a bit chickeny. I thought, fuck, he's only 50. Mm. You know. But <laughs> he looked pretty good, but it, the hair was improbable, but it was actually his. I couldn't say anything to him at all. Mm. I couldn't say Well, you were, you, you were the guy at the Star Wars exactly. convention for a moment say, then, you, weren't you? you? Your position yes, was, was switched. Yeah, you were the person you were the with guy. your chance to ask all the big questions. And you just said... No. <laughs> Same with Kate Bush. I met her once and I said, hello. <laughs> oh. I met George Harrison at a party once. He was talking to Nick Rogue, my favourite film director. The film director, yeah. yes, The Russell. Devils. There's a party given by Billy Connolly and Pamela Stevenson. And we were hip then. We got invited to stuff, you know. And I walk in and there's George Harrison. I thought, oh, jeez. And I go up and say, hello. <laughs> That's it. Hello, my name's John. And he thought, oh, Christ, who's that? You know. So you've, uh, what's the next thing on the horizon for you? Because you've done a second book, which is your uh, Star Wars from the inside, which is yeah, obviously available on Kindle. A, and we'll link, Kindle. Kindle link the listeners and viewers to that on the site. Yeah. It's, um, is there another book in the pipeline for you? What does that cover? So that people can... That one just covers how I got the job in the first place, right. what it was like filming 
Jedi. Yeah. And then a few bits that I did in between, and then this weird world of TV, um, TV commercials, autograph conventions. We can cut that bit out of the podcast, so we sell more books. You know, but it's... Um, I get the feeling that a lot of Star Wars fans don't read. <laughs> well, not because they can't, but because they, unless it's a book about well, Star Wars characters, hmm. that of a generation know, where the film was king. Well, I'll be getting it. I just need a bloody Kindle. So many people. I find it interesting. So many yeah. people don't read it at all anymore. I know it's very sad. It's quite sad. Um, well, I'll get it. Don't worry. Well, I mean, I cover some of the ground in, in Falling Upwards as well. Uh, when I had to do the rewrite, I thought, well, I'll write about, you know, Tokyo and stuff. Mm. That was a very weird 12-day adventure. Um, I have three short stories coming out in three horror anthologies. Oh. This is interesting. Awesome. Yeah. I met a guy called Dean M. Drinkle. Yes, it is his real name. <laughs> Through Barbie, um, she had a story in a Hellbound Hellraiser anthology. And she said, oh, you ought to send some stuff to this guy, Dean, because he's always looking for people to write short stories. This is stories. fiction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, horror fiction. And I thought, wow. So I got onto him, and I sent him a couple of bits that I'd written. And he said, I really like this. I'm doing an anthology called Demonology. Would you um, bang out a story? You know, three to 4,000 words. I'll give you the letter N. It's an A to Z, A to Z of demons. Hmm. So I Google demons you know you get the whole lot bloody hell that's a lot of demon words <laughs> and I, f I found a, a demon who I quite liked he's the god of deceit and possibly the demon who um, invented the internet <laughs> <laughs> he's devious or Wikipedia at least devious you never see his eyes they're either hidden by a veil <coughs> or a hat and uh, he's, he's yeah he's a troublemaker I thought I'm going to write about him doing a podcast uh, so, like tonight, it's like, hey, now we've got <laughs> my best, the, uh, you know, the devious one here. It's like, fuck's sake, whatever. He's bored, he's pissed off. I ask him the hey, same question. Hey, this questions. should be like Ethan's theme, <laughs> theme story. Yeah. So what's it like in hell? Uh, it's like Clapham on a wet Sunday. <laughs> Imagine you're naked at a bus stop with a bullseye painted on your head and you see the gang of thugs approaching. That's what hell is like forever. For you, for him, it could be something, something else. Anyway, I wrote this, and he said, wow, that's great. I've got two other anthos coming up. <laughs> One is called The Bestiarum Vocabulum. Uh, it's an A to Z of legendary beasts. Do you want to do that? Extra. Said, yes. So I said, what letter can I get? Hoping it wouldn't be A or Z. He said, well, you can have O. So I found the beast that begins with O, and I've written a really perverted story this is out now the best year on vocabulum okay came out in december through um western legends publishing we'll get a link to it on the actual uh, yeah. site for people but that want to buy it i've always written either song lyrics or themes you know ideas dreams whatever but something nice about being told to write a specific you have o for a, a starting well, yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. some some sort of structure. So because yeah. just to pick from everything is so wide that mm. it's difficult. Whereas to be given something that exactly. enables you to use your imagination, yes. but it gives you a boundary and that you can push against. And I thought this is great because I've got a, a finite word count. Otherwise, you're writing forever and ever. Mm. And thank you, Mr. Internet mm -hmm. know, Research. Uh, um, I chose. Ono Kentora, which is a, a beast that is half man, half donkey. Okay. Um, well, I can't give too much away, but <laughs> it, 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 there's an obvious correlation at work. And it ends up in a tattoo parlor in downtown Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> but it starts off in ancient Africa. Oh. But you see, the great thing and is... And the third one is still to come, is it? Or yeah, I've written that as well. That's... Okay. Um, that's uh, called Phobophobias, pho okay. and that's coming out in August, and that's mm. through Dark Continents Publishing. Again, it's an A to Z. There's something about, you get 26 authors, all given a different letter. Yeah. Poor old Barbie got Z for the um, best year on. So she came out with Zulu Zombies. <laughs> and it's a brilliant little story. It starts off with two girls, pissed girls on a train that 
missing the last train at Milton Keynes station after a hen night, and it ends up in Zulu world in Africa. Um, but yeah, no, my uh, my phobia phobia is um, the fear of going home, which is called nostrophobia, <laughs> which is an interesting phobia because most people are sort of frightened of going out. Right. Which is home is a safe place usually. Mm, not for this one. Well, in in your own kind of story, as it were, going back to Surrey when you went to stay back mm. with your mother again after Brighton, I think there was that fear, wasn't the there? The little yeah element of that, and what happens if you were really, really famous and you were mm. inexorably drawn back to the very place you wanted to get away to from? To escape. Mm. I remember reading lots of interviews with Bowie saying, "Well, I'm shackled to suburbia, you know, mm. and I know exactly what that's like. You never quite get away from it." But this is very dark as well. I, I quite surprise myself sometimes with these things. You think, where did that come from? That's bad. <laughs> but you're kind of proud of it at the same time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Barbie and I, we're our, our best readers. She reads mine and I right. read hers. And what do you think? And we're honest. So mm. you don't like that bit. That's brilliant. Do more of that. Yeah. Is there anything you when, you, when the book's released, obviously, and you have the story out there, the things you want to change, or when the, you've released the piece of work, as it were, no, you're happy done, with it? Yeah, done and dusted. I mean, you have to go th through everything a lot. And then Barbie or whoever might say, well, I'm just going to move that a bit. Mm. I mean, the main bugbear for me is, is punctuation and stuff. Uh, I feel your pain, brother. My <laughs> intent is the content rather than the structure of it. Sure. Okay, I missed a comma out. Get over it. Um, Dean will, as the editor, will go through each story and change little bits here and there. Not content, but just he might break up a paragraph into mm. so I tend to write quite big long paragraphs. Sure. But it's very liberating. Um, because in photography and in music you you're kind of limited. You you've you've given people something a fait accompli in some way that um, it sounds like that. There's no it doesn't sound like anything else. That is a guitar, that's a yeah, your audience is working less. Or a photograph. This is the image in a, and okay, I might have messed around with it, but it's still that picture with, with words. People can think, God, I wonder what that felt like or smelt like. or You're leaving enough up to someone's imagination as mm. well. So, okay, so, yeah, Phobophobia comes out in August, and I think Demonology may be the end of the year. And then, and the good news is I've got a publisher for my novella, which I've been writing oh. for, gosh, two or three years on and off. I call it a novella because it's not novel. Does length. it have a sort of theme? Can Is you tell us something about or? it? No. Or? Um, it's, it's, uh, no, it's kind of difficult, actually. Um, <laughs> okay. It's about everything and nothing. It's about dreams. It's about madness. It's about murder. It's about sex. It's about Paris. It's about London. <laughs> okay. And it's a lot of different oh, segments intriguing. all linked together by odd little events from real life like elephant kills clown dressed as a peanut <laughs> things from 14 times yeah yeah anyway I, i've been touting this for a, a little while and um i met a guy called simon marshall jones who's got an imprint called spectral press and they deal in uh, sort of the more ghostly end of horror and stuff and i thought i'm going to send it to him and it arrived on his desk at the very week he's set up a new imprint called Teatro Mundi and he said this is exactly what I want to publish this is like William Burroughs meets Hunter S. Thompson <laughs> really cool and he said I want I want this and it's the first time ever anyone has said I want this That's cool. congratulations well done it's exciting it's uh it's flattering he mm. it is yeah. enormously flattering because he said I, I'd like a series of these oh wow I'm thinking bloody hell yeah because you know it's like Kate, Kate Bush said you know you spend the your whole of your life writing your first album and you've got to write the second one in six months mm. it's a little bit like that but what I like about Simon is that he got it and I didn't have to say well it's sort of like this it's sort of, he said no I, I actually get it mm. it's it's a world on the edge of collapse seen through different people mm. different stories that may or may not relate it's about entropy it's about the universe blinking shut for a second and then reopening again and everything's been reset. It's like when your Mac goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you shut it down, you go and have a cup 
coffee or something and hope when you turn it on it's going to be the same yeah <clears throat> and it's a bit like that it's a, yeah it's a little bit like a hard drive you know with all these different things in it what's happened yeah, what are you doing I was just checking, checking the, the, the cursed <coughs> yeah. um so yes space. that's what I'm very excited about yeah, so um, and these are going to be because the, the Star Wars book is Kindle your this is yeah, hard cover. This is, I'm not a Kindle fan to be no. honest I mean but rather than c trying to do the Star Wars book as a, you know, finding a, another publisher for that, doing it as a print on demand or whatever. But the novella is going to be obviously oh, hard. Oh, no, he's going to do a physical hard copy, case, yeah. in hard case, embossed mm. cover. Is it illustrations as well, maybe? Or? I don't know, not up to <coughs> me. But, mm. but he wants to make it an exclusive, expensive thing, mm -hmm. which is awesome. very flattering. It is, yeah. Now, he's got a book on Spectral Press called Whitstable, Stephen Volk, which is one of the most enchanting books I've ever read. It's you know Peter Cushing, the horror actor. Yes. Yes. He lived in Whitstable, and his darling wife died, and he became a sort of recluse and a very lonely, sad figure. And he's living in Whitstable, and he's approached by this young boy who's being abused by his stepfather, and he and he's convinced his stepfather is a vampire, and he thinks Peter Cushing is actually Van Helsing oh. because he played him so well in the movie. And so he asks him to help him sort out his problem. But it's such an enchanting book. It's a, that's a novella, right. yeah. which is up to 40,000 words or so. And that's a great length, because people now have got very short attention spans. So short stories or novellas or whatever, it seems to be the way of it, you know. Move along fast. But this, this, is, this has got, I think there's something like 22 five-star reviews on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and that's oh, wow. So this is the guy who's publishing, going to be publishing my book. So yeah. he's very so he's good taste, yeah. Mm. But yeah. Th this world of dark speculative fiction appeals to me because I'm not a huge fan of horror, horror. Mm. Mm. You know, I think Clive Barker is a genius, but there's so much horror, especially in movies, that just doesn't work for me at all. Another guy in a mask with a meat cleaver or something. Mm. That's not horrible. Real people are horrible. Mm. You know. The monster within. So there you go. That's so writing Great. is where I want to go. Well, that's, no, it's uh, it's good. As I said, I think in the blurb we've written on the website for you, like oh, the, I've got a couple of movies. Sorry. the Swiss oh, yeah. Army knife of, of uh, performing <laughs> and arts and everything. Am, somebody <laughs> described me as a, yeah. a media polymath and a troublemaker. <laughs> like oh, that's amazing. That's, like that's that. a compliment, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, no, yeah. it is. It definitely Put it on your on your tombstone or something. Yeah. <laughs> one I day. I told you I was a media polymath, didn't I? <laughs> um, I did a short movie uh, back in March. That's why I grew this thing, actually. And I mm. thought, I'm going to keep that. It's a 10-minute movie, but I play a very bad, nasty man. It's just me and a young blonde girl, and I'm seriously fucking up um, emotionally. I'm also in a very odd movie called Le Accelerator, which is a black and white feature length movie with no dialogue, but an electronic film score. Mm. It's about a, an oriental martial arts expert. I was going to say, it looks like some kind of John Woo uh, It like is John Woo action. with Shaft. Yeah. And I play the death provider. I'm an arms dealer in mm. that. And that's going to come out later this year. And then both Barbie and myself are going to be in this movie called Bad Medicine, which is a portmanteau horror movie. You know, like Dr. Terror's House of House Horrible. House of Horrible, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you get five different stories that interweave. And like the old Amicus films, yeah. this is just a thing to uh, like hammer, this, of course, it's yeah. It's really dark. What's happening? Nothing. <laughs> um, so. And that's you and Barbie, I'm is it? Playing an alien in that. Another alien. Yeah, See, he's back. No. <laughs> darling, I think the days are squeezing into a rubber suit. <laughs> you never know, they might oh. spring it on you on the day, but like, Tim, actually, we're going to yeah. put filming back in. I said, I, I'd love to do it if I can be visible as me. Because one thing I've learned from conventions is that the people that have got their face out mm. sell a lot do, more. Do better. Yeah. yeah. Unless you are Dave Rowles or. Was there not, a, I guess, after you did Extra and Stars, was there not a danger of you becoming the man in the suit? Were you getting lots of offers of things like that? No. No, the only thing we were offered, we auditioned for Aliens mm. as Aliens. And we, we, I think we were think we were given the job but then they didn't get the money they wanted so they scrapped it and when they finally did get the money we weren't They'd in the loop. Yeah. Damn. Shot at but uh, Acton no, Power Station. You know, I, I said 
if I can have my face out and we, we can, I can do my own dialogue, because there's quite a lot of dialogue, mm. it's like a sort of a fatherly alien, if mm. you like, with an arterial motor. Um, is there any other kind? <laughs> Barbie's going to be playing the psychiatrist, who, who is the link between these five different stories. Now, they're doing a fundraiser for this, so I hope they can get the money for that. Yeah. Well, is there anything you can mention on the show for people? Maybe a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter or something? Or we can add it onto the website. It won't be a Kickstarter. It'll be um, Indiegogo. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, if you can get us a link to it, we can have it up yeah, on the site. We'll mention it now, of course. You can, uh, I guess, co-finance all of you uh, this film that Tim and Barbie are going to do, two horror icons. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very, very good script. You know, it's, it's full feature length. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very dark. Hmm. I don't know. One of my bits in it. Do you know the Chris Cunningham video for Apex Twins? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, <sighs> that yeah. face creature, Scree and the, the old, old lady. lady yeah. Sort of, it's got that sort of vibe to it. There's some sort of inner city thing. And then I abduct this poor guy, and you know, it's 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 just it's a very clever script. Yeah. You know. But I do like the idea of the portmanteau yeah. thing. I think that's that should come back. So he's not Jason the, no, the no. thief or something. Oh, God, no. Yeah. As well as you and Barbie, who else is going to be in it? Do you know uh, yet? Guys or? who've worked with a director and a writer before, I don't know who they are. They've got a film called Ascension, which is done by the festival of this film. So this is the first, f first time you'll have worked on camera in years, I guess, right? Or well, I never thought I'd be doing anything like that again. Obviously, my days of doing TV commercials have gone. Sadly, I mean, occasionally I'll go for something, but um, you've got to say I had 12 years of it, and that's, mm. that's enough, you know. Um, no, I, I like the idea of doing something unusual. I'm never going to be, you know, Rafe Fiennes or... I don't, well, you know, the game's not over yet, dude, come on. You've yeah. reinvented yourself so many times. Yeah, but it's not up to me anymore, <laughs> you know. It, it's, I think once you've been out of the loop for long enough well, you're getting back in the game now with this film it might crack you wide again and who knows where it'll go with the, the it novels the movies be, see i have to be very careful that i don't overdo everything mm. you know i tend to gesture too much as the gurn quite a lot more <laughs> and in this the short movie the 10 minute one i'm just behind a desk and i'm just delivering this really unpleasant stuff so you're gonna have to get again anything Against all your training, keep it from the neck yeah. up. <laughs> but it's like, God, this is really quite liberating, isn't it? Mm. And I terrified the girl. Animated. She's a lovely girl, Laura Marsh. Um, she's a singer as well. But uh, she, she then turns it on me. She gets very angry with me. And it's like, whoa, God, are you, are you acting? I thought you just might be inventing something here. You know? <laughs> but yes, it, it's, it's just very surprising. That you know, so I haven't done a lot of acting. So when somebody's really acting at you, mm. you're thinking, Christ, what have I done? Yeah. Oh, it's hang kind of on. We're really in the scene. It's in, in the script, isn't it? That's amazing. Um, right. That's enough about me. Let's talk about you. Well, I was going to say, we, Alex just m told me we were at 2.16, so we're going to run out of disk space oh, very no, shortly. Thanks. So we need to wrap it up, I'm I wrap think. It up. So uh, <coughs> everybody listening... Uh, we're going to have a competition. I'm not, what's your time frame? Because we need to get this out to the, his fans, obviously, and stuff. I'm going to give away a signed autobiography of uh, Tim's oh, amazing life. I think we'll buy another one. I'm going to give away <coughs> the action figure of Jay Quill, what, only Jay one of the characters he played in Star Wars, and uh, a trading card. And I'm sure Tim can throw in a goodie or two of autographery, but we're going to sign all this stuff. And... Uh, obviously have it sent out to you, but we'll have a question posted mm. on the Facebook page, Ethan McKinley's Questionable. And there's another one. That's yeah. got me and Sean and... Oh, wow, yeah. And that's him and Sean, tick and tock there. Yeah. Talk. Jack Face, Jay Quill, uh, Michael Carter playing Bib Fortuna. I don't know yeah. who else is in there. Uh, is Gerald Holm playing Squidhead. <laughs> Squidhead, that's the first Return of the Jedi action figure I actually bought, Squidhead. Tessic is now <coughs> called. So, yes, uh, we've got Two films coming out. Mm -hmm. We've got a novella. Yep. We've got short uh, story, the, the short story. Uh, the we're novella's link. called Ricochet, by the way. Oh, Ricochet, brilliant. Uh, anything that's already released will, of course, uh, link you on the website of Tim's page, and uh, we can flog some merch. <laughs> and uh, uh, please come on again.
when I this demand full Photoshop retouching on every, <laughs> every frame of this. Uh, well, that's no, I, it's uh, been a, a real pleasure. Yeah. No, it's been a pleasure. It's, it's like literally, you. it's been. Uh, time has, time has flown. There was one interview you were doing. You were doing this yes, all the I, time. Yes, that's what I said. So he what? was. I don't I'm not sure if it's the air conditioner or something, but I'm like constantly. I do touch my neck a lot when I'm listening to people. So much. So I've got a red neck. What's that? Rumours in. You might have fleas. Yes. No, but it has. It's been like a. A real pleasure to meet you. I think even Thank before you. all the guests we had on, I earmarked you in my head because, like, when I discovered Tim Dry, t- and I put extra together from back in the day that you you were extra, tenuous link. But I was like, oh my god, I'm. Uh, it's it really is a exciting and, and an honour to meet yeah, you, sir. Really, really. Sh- time is time is just <laughs> gone. It's and gone. You know, like yeah. a crazy time going thing. What was a couple of days uh, like? Well, about these fans, but what a couple of days of work you did thirty years ago is like made a, a, a oh, fan this is what is so weird for me I cannot believe that all this stuff was 30 years ago mm. you know shock at Wembley Garen Union 32 years ago extra 33 years ago Star well it's Wars. like I said it's not over I mean they're doing more Star Wars is civilizations have risen and fallen <laughs> the you're the Alexander the Great of uh, the arts oh <laughs> yes without the hair um, the breadth of his domain, he wept for the memoir Worlds to Conquer. You know, the director of Extra, Harry Bromley Davenport, he dissed it totally for donkey's years. To be oh. fair, Harry, it is the best of the three. Two and three Don't make no watch sense. Two and three. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, buy them as a trilogy, but stick with the first it's one. It's rubbish, it's crap, it's bollocks. You know? And then over the years, he's actually, a lot of people really like Extra. I th- maybe it's not. Maybe I'll do Extra. Four. Let's go back to the well. Uh, no. You could be you in it. You could be like some doctor or scientist that's trying to find extra. Or it could be the old man in the corner. Exactly, <laughs> something. I was there when that creature come out and <laughs> did all that bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, oh, it's... Uh, hey, never say never, you know. Whatever happens, I'll do it. You know. Well, no, it's been a real pleasure meeting you and uh, <laughs> going through this, like this pantheon of like amazing yeah. things you've done, really. So oh, that's very sweet. Tim Dry, thank you so much for coming on. Yes. Oh. And it's going to be like very difficult for me to let these go now you've signed them, because I'm a fan. But uh, yeah, sir, when uh, the oh, book... Uh, uh, he'll enter say? under a fake name, you know. <laughs> if the book or the movie's coming out, times. come on again uh, later in the year or next year or sure. in the summer or whatever, anything you want. You're welcome here any time. Oh. Uh, I think Barbie's going to come on at some point with uh, Nicholas and Simon as a kind of Hellraiser horror round table. So You're going to do all three at once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think Doug is in, in LA with Clive Barker, no, so that's going to be a... Be around, I don't think, but... Um, yeah, because all the Cenobites, all the Cenos, are mm. doing this big convention in Atlantic City. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's doing this show is like, it's fascinating and wonderful meeting all these like icons of my childhood. Really is. Boy. You're, you're a horror and sci-fi icon, sir. That's, I just find that flattering, but odd. <laughs> well, it's odd in the sense it was a throwaway moment for you, I think, in the, all the other things you've done, but it's the one thing well, that kind of keeps coming back to... St- I never stick thought on you. that anything would sort of rise above other stuff. Mm. So I did Star Wars, that was a great gig, move mm. on, do this, do that, blah, blah. But now I realise that was actually a peak, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, a pinnacle. One of, yeah. A pin arc. It still is a peak. I mean, it's taking you to uh, well, Legoland and I mean around the world, a pinnacle surely. because of the effect it has on right. people. And it's now three generations. And that's what's amazing. You're sat there with your piles of furry alien pics, you know. <laughs> And so you get dad who might be, you know, somewhere between you and me, mm. age-wise, probably, you know, 40-something. He's got a kid, and they've got a kid. And they're all... Waiting for a signature. Yeah. Was it hot? Shut up! One <laughs> <of the> time. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? No. You should just have it on a card you, like, push out to people so you don't talk. You're just like... Yes, it's... There. You should just put up a little sign saying, yes, it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> Do the checklist. Thanks. Sign it. Move on. Thank you. Yeah. No. Uh, no. No. I won't, I won't go there. There are a couple <laughs> of people that are so up themselves. Really? We'll save it for another show. Maybe Robert uh, Watts can come on and like oh. call it like he sees it because I know he'd Bless like. <laughs> you'd, have, you'd get a lot of info out of Robert. Yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm. <laughs> wow. Even more fascinating. Now he's been doing no, uh, but drinking you'd, you'd the vine a, of the ayahuasca and at stuff. At least a terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> We need uh, a bigger I chip. I was going to be do, writing actually. Robert's um, biography, actually, and we started oh, really? recording him speaking. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, but we did hours and hours of it, and 
he's still at prep school. It's like, oh, because <laughs> you know he, how he ended up in Star Wars. That was very odd. Mm. You know, so well, I think he did fascinating man. But yeah, I think he did the red shoes and the Palin Pressburger stuff. I no. think didn't he? I know he did uh, the Kubrick stuff, didn't he? He did, uh, yeah, some stuff on two thousand and one. Uh, that was his sort of intro. I think that's how he got to the attention of Gary Kurtz, who got him in for Star Wars. But uh, it's very brave to walk away from Lucasfilm mm. after the third indie movie. And just yeah, like, that's it. No, it's great. I think that's why I like yeah. him so much. Every DVD I've seen him on, he's like he really does like go for it. He names names and he doesn't hold anything back. He's no. like yeah, and he's very with it and sharp and he's like yeah. he's such a character. No, he's an absolute sweetheart. Yeah, aren't you, Robert? <laughs> no, he is. He's a darling. Um, I don't know whether what's in it for him really, because he he's set up a new production company in the states, mm. and I don't know how that's doing. But it would he's trying to get back into having control and doing movies of a, of a kind of more esoteric, uh, dare I say, spiritual kind of. Well, he's opened his he's opened his third eye, if you'll excuse the pun, yeah, by no, doing oh, all the psychedelics. So yeah. Uh, that's what he wants. He doesn't want to do wham, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of movies, you know. Mm. But that's what people want, mm. you know. Mm. I've seen him talking at conventions. I've seen him talking about 9-11 at conventions and things on YouTube videos. I'm like, wow, he's got like, he's so, so many facets to this guy and he doesn't care. He's just like, this is what I think. And well, he's very big on Joseph Campbell yeah. and, um, uh, God, John C. Lilly, who wrote The Scent of a Cyclone, Day of a Dolphin, all these things, you know, Flotation tanks, uh, immersion techniques. Well, he used to inject mescaline and then go into the flotation tank, didn't he, Lily? That's so uh, <laughs> that's odd. As uh, if, as if the flotation tank's not enough. <laughs> Have we cut yet? No, yeah. No, oh, shit. <laughs> but we will cut now. Yeah. Uh, Tim right. Dry, we love yes. you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, you can find Tim at the next convention, which is where? Uh, the closest one to here is uh, Olympia in yeah. July, London Film and Comic Con. Yeah. And then you've got the other one in November at Earl's Court, is that right? Or London? No, mm -hmm. uh, November's Birmingham. At the Birmingham. NEC. I'm doing one in Southampton uh, in October. Do you have a website uh, that people can find you on if they want to, like... There is a website called Star Wars Actors Appearances. Cool. And do you have a personal, your personal website? What about you? Yes. Not your personal email, fans. <laughs> uh, your personal website. Co .uk. And you're awesome. at TimDry1, aren't you, on Twitter? Or yeah. Yeah. Already, I yeah, I haven't quite already worked already out Twitter yet. No, they changed the layout I discovered yesterday. But oh, <laughs> right, you've made that bit really big and that bit. Boom. There's actually a thing you can get on a laptop called TweetDeck, which makes it like more of an easier layout to follow. So I use that because Twitter on the thing is too much for me. I don't mm. get it. You, people say, oh, you, if you follow lots of people, they'll follow you. Well, hey. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't no, work for don't. me. I'm following lots of people, no one's following me. <laughs> but you can follow me uh, at Ethan McKinley UK on <laughs> Twitter. You can find Alex at Alex Consuelo. <laughs> and uh, yes like our page on Facebook Ethan McKinley's Questionable go to Tim's site <coughs> uh, buy some of his lovely merchandise please do get this uh, Dream Orphans oh, his latest hell. album and get his books so we'll link you all on the website there's, it's, this, this is the problem this is the first case we've had that's done so much stuff I am available it, for bar mitzvahs social <laughs> it requires a podcast in itself to list, uh, list his uh, achievements but yes uh, the die is cast or my pod is cast we will link you all, uh, Star Wars horror fans and uh, literary fans, uh, to Tim and all the things that you can get involving him uh, on the website. And uh, we'll see you yeah. soon. Thank, Thank you, Tim. You. Thank you for coming. You sexy beast. <laughs> Thank you. Come on again soon. <laughs> I'll be there. Bye. <laughs> Bye.